And we are recording. All right. Welcome to G Slade's Indie Music Showcase. I am excited to be here on another episode with Mr. T.C. Elliott, the one and only Mr. T.C. Elliott. He stopped writing new songs long enough to talk to me for a little bit, and I appreciate it. T.C., welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And I was just writing a song not five seconds ago, and you interrupted that, so I hope you appreciate it. Yeah, man. Uh, how many songs are you not going to write because you talk to me? Um, at least a dozen. At least a dozen. I actually said when I was talking to, um, I think it was uh, Januarius, um, and he was talking about you should be on the show. <laughs> I was like, I have no idea how he's going to pick the songs because he's it got at least, you know, a thousand of them or something. And he's got, you know, he's going to send me like five or six or something like that. Like, uh, how hard was that? Um, both extremely difficult and not hard at all. Uh, so I've written a ton of songs, but most of them are really not very good. So it was easy to cut out like 90 percent of them right off the top. Uh, and then I just started, so I've been in the process of um, thinking about putting an album out for the last couple of months. And so I've already gone through and listened to some of my own music recently, just not just in the past few weeks or two months or so. And then I got to think, and I mean, I changed my mind three or four times. And when I started writing stuff down, I'm like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. And and finally, I just sat down and I was like, boom. And it was basically mostly stuff either off an album or recent or whatever. And I was like, fine, that's it. And then after I sent it to you, I changed my mind about 20 times. And I was like, nah, I'm not going to bother him. We're going to go with whatever I sent him. And honestly, I'm not a hundred percent sure what I sent you. So, <laughs> Well, we're going to have fun figuring it out. Um, I mean, the idea is to drive more traffic to your music. So, you know, you don't have to send your whole discography in one episode and no one's limited to one episode, man. You can come back and we could play more music when you get an album out. I actually want to start doing like album release, uh, like virtual album release parties on the show, you know, whether live stream or recorded, whatever. And uh, I think that'd be a whole lot of fun. Yeah, that'd, that'd be cool. Um, a absolutely cool. I'd like to hear that if you do that. And as far as coming back, you know, don't make promises you don't want to keep. You wait to see what the episode's like before you make a promise like that. Well, since we're pre-recorded, nobody will know unless I want them to know. <laughs> there you go. Awesome. <laughs> All right, man. So uh, it's evident we have a, a prior relationship, you know, that it's not a, uh, a cold interview, as I call it, when I talk to people I've never met before. But you and I met many years ago, I think probably 50, 90, 2008, because my first fall was 2009. So we've been listening to each other uh, or not listening to each other for years, depending on whatever year it was. Uh, and so it is January 27th when we're recording. Uh, how excited is it that FOM is uh, right around the corner, man? Um, not as exciting as usual, uh, but still exciting. I, I love FOM in 5090. Um, but it's only been in the last couple of years that that farm has kind of risen up and and to the level of 5090 for me. Um, there's just it's so many people. It's it's so great. But it seems like by the time I get rolling and try to do everything I want to do, it's kind of over. Um, it's almost too busy um, where 5090 is a little bit more sedate pace, even though the number of songs per day is higher, the amount of people participating is a lot lower. The number of songs therefore are lower um, in total. And so it just seems like you can, or at least for me, I can get a little bit more sense of community each year. That's a little bit different, but still uh, continuous, if that makes sense. Like, like, you know, the same relationships go through and, you know, I was just looking back at last fall and there were different farmers that I just dis discovered and listened to and loved. And I'm trying to remember who's who and how many years ago it was that I was collaborating or whatever it was I was doing. And, you know, I, I can't remember my own stuff, much less what I've done with somebody else. So it's it's a little overwhelming. And then personally, I've got some stuff going on um, health wise in the family and some stuff going on. It's been a pretty stressful last couple of months. So 
So time-wise, I'm probably not going to have a whole, whole, at least as much as usual for this February. So that's kind of a downer. But in a way, I think it might be good for me. Instead of racing to 14 songs or 20 songs or however many I can do, I think I'm going to focus on less songs. And if I, I can get 14, I'm sure of it, but maybe focus more on doing like more meaningful songs instead of just doing all skirmishes and spitting them out, which I like to do and get good songs from sometimes. But, but you know, maybe a little bit more methodical or a little bit more um, purposeful in what I'm doing and spend that time, that hour on, on another song or, or another relationship or something like that. So I, I expect not to be quite as involved as usual, but still around, still listening, still writing. And so it's kind of a weird form for me this year, but hopefully a good one. Yeah, sorry to hear you got things going on, man. I can't empathize with that. Um, I missed a few farms because of that, divorces and moving around and things like that. And then uh, I did one with a sinus infection the entire time. So doing I remember vocal that, yeah. Ta- yeah, doing vocal takes was an uh, epic struggle. So, I mean, you make a good point. See, to me, I'm the opposite. I can't, I can't get into 5090. It's too big of a goal for me like not that it's unattainable but it's just too like the deadline so far away it's hard for me to get in the uh zone about it you know maybe like let's see it's what june or no it's july august september you know like september 1st i I get excited about it because there's only a month and and i can feel like it's compressed and exciting because that's what i like about FOM is the excitement the compression you know uh there is such a drop off though my, my funniest thing about farm to me is everyone's on there and they're like um you know it's kind of like when you meet new people at a bar and you party with them and at the end of the night you're like yeah we're gonna be friends forever we should hang out and you never speak again to me that's what farm is like they're like this was the best thing ever we're all riding that high and then we're like you know all march we're gonna be listening and commenting and like march 7th there's like three people right. on the forum you know like even even the mods aren't checking by that time, you know, it's, uh, but I see, I know what you mean about relationships and it's hard to do everything you want to do. Right. Cause you want to, you want to participate and support other people. And I I'm in the same mode as you, you know, trying to do more quality, less quantity, not doing less quantity, but that's, that's not the goal. It's usually the side effect that I'm doing less quantity. Cause I want better songs. Whereas my first few years, I was just like, I gotta win. I gotta get 14, uh, you think that's the normal, you know, uh, kind of arc, your story arc for FOM when you join? It's about, you know, winning FOM. And then as you go, you just, you know, want to be better. Yeah, I think that's the case in songwriting in general, honestly. But uh, for FOM, like I listened back, 2008 was my first year of FOM. And, you know, the songs were atrocious. They were just awful. And um, but the community was so good to me. Nancy Ross, especially, and Hoops, and Helen Robertson, and um, oh, a whole bunch. Charlie Cheney and Mal back in the day, and Debs. And I mean, I could go on and on and on. But but how Nancy, about uh, how about Villa, man? I miss that dude. Yeah, yeah. Tim was. He, and honestly, that first year, I didn't really understand Tim or or even interact with Tim that much. I, I got to Tim through hoop shank. So, um, and we had the, the old style chat that uh, Charlie Cheney originally had that year and, um, or maybe the year before, I don't know, um, on his server. And then Mal kind of took that over. And so those of us that were in the chat a lot, and I think Tim was in there some actually. Um, but in 2008, 2009, and maybe 2010 were kind of the peak years of that. I think, although, it might have gone past that, but no, I Nancy, think you're right. I think you're right about 2010 and 2011. It kind of peaked. Yeah. And then, but Nancy was just so like, you know, I listened back and I'm like, she was so just so encouraging, like above and beyond. And, you know, uh, that I, I just, everybody was, and it didn't matter how good you were or what you were doing. You're just trying to be creative. And I think that's the thing for FOM. It's to be creative. And it doesn't matter if it's, you want four songs that are well-recorded that you can polish up and re- and release, or if you're going for 14 or if you're going for 40 and you're just trying to get songs written so you can go back and see what you want to work on. It doesn't matter as long as you're being creative. And most people, you know, 90 something percent, I would say, understand that even if it's not um, in those, you know, in that framework 
that it's the most important thing for farm is to to be creative and and I think you were having this discussion with uh, Volpine and talking about the farm stuff, but the thing about farm and the cheerleading and all that stuff, it's just to be creative. And I think there's plenty of places on this, on the internet where you can get critiques or you can, you know, get an honest feedback, whether that's good, bad, or indifferent, but farm is a place where we're being creative. And if it takes away from that to me, then it's unacceptable. And other than that, so. So for my art, you know, I was pretty crappy and pretty crappy. And then it slowly got better. And then just all of a sudden somewhere I started liking the songs, like just the one-off songs and the skirmishes were, I noticed the the average quality of the non-keepers were going up before the quality of the keepers, if that makes sense. So like I was still getting a good song here and there, you know, one out of five or one out of 10 or whatever it was, but, but it was the junk or the stuff that that wasn't that top tier or that top 20 percent or whatever that average was getting better and that's what eventually encouraged me to kind of work on quality instead of quantity and then the, the quantity kind of follows that too so i don't know Yeah, I know what you're saying about the community too. Those early years, it was so, uh, for one, it was a lot smaller, right? So it, it felt like you knew everybody. And yeah, I remember the chat rooms. I mean, we would write songs in the chat room, you know. Yep. Uh, that's when we wrote the Benadryl zombie song, you know, was in the chat room. Uh, Teenage Mutant Benadryl zombies or some <laughs> crazy shit like that. It had everybody on it. Me, Nancy, Hoopshank, um, a few other people I can't recall, but yeah. Um, it was great. And then Hoopshank um, produced it, you know, he did the mixing and uh, up until that point, I never sounded that good, you know, cause I always did my crappy mixing and yeah. audacity. And then like bootleg versions of uh cakewalk, which I think turned into uh audition or something, which is what I use now. Adobe audition legitimate, by the way. Thank you, Adobe. <laughs> um, I'm a subscriber, but yeah. And, and now like, those same staples are there right but there's so many more people on there now you know I, I, and i try to listen to that you know because now you have like these sections of people right that you know your folk people over here your rockers there's a little more rap there's more electronica on there which is exciting i know you dabble in multiple genres right i mean you kind of go from the folk spectrum over to the rock pop spectrum so is that you know just something you do during foam do you try to do that all year and would would you say you have a you know a main genre lane you you know excel in and you just dabble in others or can you excel anywhere so uh genre hopping are you is the question do i do that all year round or just in farm yeah yeah the question is that just experiments you do during the challenges or is that something you always do um a little bit of both uh, probably farm and 5090 um, typically are more of a playground for me. Um, it allows me to, I mean, I, well, first of all, there's more people to collaborate with, so I don't take advantage of that as much as I should. Although I do, some years I do have a lot of collaborations, so it's not like I shy away from it, avoid it. But, you know, if you, um, you know, if you're in the, and so I go in the Slack chat quite a bit, um, still, um, and been fairly steady through the years and that, and that's a really good way, you know, um, one year, uh, flex was in the, in the Slack room chat. I think it was Slack by then a few years back. And we did a song, I think it was called light bulb ghosts or something right at the end of the challenge. And he was like, Hey, and I'm like, sure. Well, I would never do anything like that. You know, he was able to produce something that I would never ever be able to do on my own and it's not that it's that far out there it's not out of the realm of possibility but it's just you know i wouldn't have been able to do it that's not my where i would go and you can do that on the board somebody says hey i've got this lyric or hey i've got this track will somebody you know top line it or i guess they call it adding music and vocals to it but that allows the free reign and, and you can post something that's obviously shabby in quality, but has that spark and somebody will find something redeeming in it. And, 
And that's encouraging that you have a playground or a place where you can try different things or take on a challenge or do whatever and not be afraid somebody's going to point out the obvious. In, in my case, there's a lot of obvious flaws, and but they're not going in to find the flaws. And I think a lot of people mistake feedback on the internet in general and just music in general as feedback isn't always pointing out the flaws, even though that's what we resort to. I mean, that's typically what pops up. You know, if everything's going smooth and then you're going to enjoy it, you're not going to notice things, individual things. It's when it it's when it's not quite right or when something's so good that it's noticeable. But typically you're going to listen to a song and if, if it's a if it's a good song, when you're done, you're like, hey, that was a good song. And you're not noticing the parts and the pieces. And I think we as songwriters, first of all, uh, have a, a, I know for myself, I have the habit of tearing apart every song I hear. And so it's very hard for me to just put on music, listen, and just enjoy the the music without listening to the bass or the drums or, or the transition or the modulation. My wife listens to top 40 countries. So I listen to, you know, there's a lot of cool techniques that I don't use. I don't listen to that on my own at all or very rarely. Um, but I do like traditional country. I like folk. I like bluegrass. I like a lot of other things that kind of feed into it. And so I do learn from it. So genre hopping. I, and the other thing is growing up, I guess, a shout out to my dad and my mom, but my dad in particular, he had a big vinyl album collection. And then when I was, I remember being six or seven years old and, and moving back to Missouri, um, my dad comes back after that. My parents were split up and then I'm with him on the weekend. He's going to a bluegrass concert in Salem, Missouri, and he drags me along. And so growing up, you know, I was exposed to live music at a fundamental age that I didn't even understand. I was exposed to, he had Black Sabbath, Paranoid, original vinyl. He also listened to the Holy Modal Rounders and bluegrass music and folk music and, and, um, he didn't really get into the blues much, but other than that, but he did like Dave Van Ronk and, and a lot of folkies and some blues kind of reached in that way. I mean, just so many different styles and everything that it didn't, it was a lot later that it occurred to me that, that music was, uh, com compartmentalized, compart com was divided. I did that. Good job on that, man. Good job. I think, I think you nailed it. I saved it. So, and, uh, so not, I don't know. I mean, listening to, you know, Simon and Garfunkel, I think Paul Simon's one of the best songwriters. Um, he's just amazing, but all at the same time, I know his music's not for everybody. Um, Jimi Hendrix, my all time favorite guitarist, and he kind of was, a uh, a, a genre hopper in a sense that he melded so many different styles, R and B and, and rock and and Dylan and everything in together. And then he could play some pretty different styles, even though, you know, he's basically his class. I mean, it's what we call classic rock or, or, or the beginning Imagine of Hawker. If he were alive today, what he would be doing in the music yeah. industry with today's technology and an artist would be. Yeah. He's, I, I had this argument for the last, 30 or 40 years with different people and what do we be doing and this, that, and the other. And I, I think, so like I read somewhere that like Gil Evans and he were talking about doing a project together and, and, you know, taking his, cause you know, he's not educated musically, you know, he's not able to read music, but his ear and able to perform and able to play, you mix that with a jazz arranger. Um, I heard something about him and Miles Davis might maybe wanting to do something or jam or do something, you know, that how, how awesome would that be? Um, Sam Cooke, that'd have been a fun one. Sam Cooke and Jimi Hendrix. Yeah, I just like, I think I think Jimi Hendrix had the potential to do amazing things, and I but I honestly think if he lived, he would have kind of gone into obscurity a little bit, almost because he wouldn't have been. I don't think he would as been interested to try to hit the top forty rock doing whatever's popular. He wanted to do and explore music and really be because I mean, he was a musician. He was a an artist first and. I think the music business, the music industry really, really got to him. And if you read some of the bi biographies of him, um, some of that really comes out to where the business of it and the having to play and trying to make money for the for the system and his team was was really what was bringing him down. And, and I wonder if 
if he wouldn't have been doing amazing things that it would have taken us years to hear because of it. Um, yeah, he probably would have got more engaged when the internet came around and kind of liberated the artists from the labels where he could do indie stuff a little easier. He, he might have got more engaged in it. Yeah, but that would have been 25 years after he died, though, before it was really accessible. I mean, you know, you're looking, what, mid-90s before? Right, before... I'm just saying he might have come back in like a, not so much a creator <laughs> role, but like a mentor and, and participated yeah. in the industry. I mean, imagine him lending his you know samples or making new riffs for the hip-hop artist of the 90s and early 2000s you know that would have been some really interesting arrangements uh going on there yeah i see what you're saying and, and i agree 100 percent. i mean i just he's just one of those creators that astounds me um I mean, I love his stuff. And, but if you listen to his songwriting, you know, his phrasing is not great. The way he, he'll squeeze in three extra, you know, six extra syllables in a line after another line. Like, it's not the best songwriting in the world, but his songs are some of the best in the world. So I don't know how you can <laughs> separate those two, but. Well, yeah, but like, you know, you're talking about your, you know, vinyls and <clears throat> how you love that. My favorite vinyl ever is I, I found an original pressing of the uh, experience, you know, are you experienced vinyl at a record awesome. shop, not far down the road. And I was, I was happy to pay a hundred dollars for it, yeah. you know, cause it is a 67 or whatever year it was that it came out. And uh, man, I played it as soon as I got home and flipped it over, played it again. You know, it's, it's timeless yeah. and, and nobody sounds like right. that. Um, but you know, a lot of big artists can't read music. You know, the Beatles were famous for not reading music, right? You know, they would learn a chord, they knew chords and all that. They were excellent musicians, but not, and they were great, you know, writers and composers, but you give them some sheet music, you know, they yeah. might be pretty lost. Yeah. I'd, I'd say in the Beatles case though, they were fairly, um, technique wise and songwriting wise. I mean, that was, especially for the time. I mean, that was fairly advanced, especially in the rock room, you know? I mean, them and, and some of the, you know, fusion that came after and all that stuff. But, but I mean, if you, if you, I don't remember who it is that has the, the blog that talks about all the Beatles song, one of the farmers, I'm, I know I'm going to get the name wrong, so I'm not going to guess, but um, if you I go know through, what you're talking about. I can't remember the name either, and, but I know he does a Beatles blog and uh, there's always a Beatles thread every year. And there's always people that are like, why are we talking about the Beatles? And I'm like, well, you don't have to talk about the Beatles. We want to talk about. Yeah, and the Beatles aren't my favorite band by any stretch, but I have a pretty deep appreciation for what they were able to do. But part of that is you have to understand the time they were in and what came before, what came after. And they were the driving force between a lot of this, you know, psychedelic rock and a whole bunch of stuff sprouted out from some of the experiments they did. I mean, Sgt. Pepper's, to me, the melodies on Sgt. Pepper's, da 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 da, it's a little sing songy. It's not something that I want to, that's not what I go to. It's not, but listen to that album and what came before it and how they put it together. And it's amazing. It really is. Doesn't mean I'm going to put it on first. I like the white album. So that's what I'm going to put on first. See, uh, I, I never got into that because it's all over the place, right? It's so hard to make a good double album because, you know, the songs, it feels like you're listening to three albums. Uh, for me, it's Rubber Soul. I just <laughs> love Rubber Soul because they were in the middle of that, that kind of, you know, uh, bopping teen stage where they were writing for the girls and right. before they got full blown, you know, Sergeant Pepper, yellow submarine mystery tours kind of stuff. And um, to me, it was like the best time. And, you know, like the sister album of that is revolver. Right. Yeah. And so those two together uh, to me is the essential section of them. I mean, all their stuff is great on some level. Let it be is a great album. Abbey Road is a great album. I mean, Abbey Road, the first half, it's a great album. I mean, the second half is just kind of that weird song that never ends. Uh, you know right. what I'm saying? Um, but yeah, but anyway, uh, we all know the story of the Beatles, so that's great. I'm actually <laughs> going to rewind because we just kind of like started a conversation like we know each other, which we do. So, but let's rewind it. And I want to know why T.C. Eliot started making music and where you are in the world and how you got to how you got to the 2008, you know, decision to start doing these challenges and why you started playing in the first place and your you know what i mean kind of your backstory all right well um so growing up both my my father and my mother were both music lovers so they you know playing music was 
a thing. Um, whether it was vinyl, the radio was on all the time. And so that, that really started it. Um, but my parents were apart. Like, I don't remember when we were ever a family for any length of time because my father was in the Air Force and they got split up when I was five, the whole thing. But when I started hanging around my dad a little bit more, when he got out of the Air Force and we all came back to Missouri one at a time, it seemed like um, he'd always have a, an acoustic guitar around. Um, and he's not the most accomplished musician by any stretch. Um, but you know, he plays a little bit guitar. He plays a little bit fiddle, a little bit of mandolin, you know, he's able to, you know, pick out a tune. Um, so it was just around. Um, and as a result, I'd pick it up and try to play and fail miserably for a long time. And then somewhere around nine or 10 years old, my mother got me a JC Penney's acoustic guitar, um, which was not the best acoustic guitar to learn on. And then I had two lessons or three lessons from a local guy. And then he was moving away. So I didn't get any more lessons. And from that point on, if I was going to play this thing that was sitting in the basement, then I had to kind of teach myself. I'd kind of pink at it. And so that's what I did. I'd plink at it here and there. And then in the summer, my eventually my dad moves to Texas. I go to Texas. I pick up his guitar every summer. I get another acoustic guitar and this goes on for a long time. And then I discover, uh, honestly, I discovered Jimi Hendrix. So, um, and, and it was, Hey Joe, um, that album. So I kind of played with the guitar, but I couldn't really play the guitar. You know, I knew five, you know, cowboy chords or whatever. And in that process of playing, I couldn't figure out a song. So I just made up my own chord progressions with no lyric or anything like starting early, like at 12 years old or 10 years old or whatever, I would just kind of make up chord progressions. And then I could play, I could strum along to Hey Joe one day um, as a teenager. And then it was easier to make up my own stuff. Uh, fell in, in because I knew a little bit of guitar. I fell in with some musicians in, in college and they were playing and doing stuff. And then I would make up a little bit or a little bit of part. And then because I'm not very good, I made up my own stuff instead of trying to learn how to play the hard stuff. And eventually that was starting to write my own songs. And then in, in there in the middle, I was started writing poetry in high school due to a creative writing course. So the two just kind of met accidentally. And then, you know, I'd write a song or two a year. Sometimes it'd be three or four in a week and then six or eight months or a year um, goes by. Um, I'm in college. I meet some musicians. Eventually that leads into a cover band, when, you know, 10 years later and everybody's playing music and somebody comes up with an idea and I'm like, well, here, I've got this idea. So that led to playing a couple of original songs and then playing around on the internet, finding FOM. Accidentally, I was searching for something else and I found FOM and I signed up for it. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to do this. And I don't know if I can win, but I can do it. And then that just really, I mean, that you was the beginning. naturally found FOM. Nobody was like, hey, you should do this. Yeah, I, I don't remember how I originally found it, but I remember, so there was a comomusic.com or something. It's a local website that has been gone for 10 years here in town in Columbia, Missouri. And we were talking, there was, it was just a message board and we were, we were messaging and something like that. And I remember searching and on the search result, FOM was one of those results. So I don't know what caused me to search or what even the search it was, but when I clicked on it, I was like, oh, write songs. I like writing songs. That, that's where it started. And I signed up and then actually another local guy here that I, um, I used to be on pool league with. Um, ended up joining up with me like the next year or something. And I didn't even know he was a musician. I had no idea he was a bass player and, and that was cool. And I went to the um, vendor forum and uh, Kevin Emmerich came over from there. I mean, it was, it just seemed like a bunch of people that I was kind of new through the internet, mainly kind of joined up 2008, 2009, 2010, and, and really kept it going. It was, it was pretty exciting to find Falm, but I, I mean, Falm's where the, I don't want to say serious songwriting, but the routine really started where it's every week. I make, you know, I expect to write a song a week and it's not 
okay, I've got to write a song this week. It's just, if I go more than a week without doing something, then I start feeling it. And there's lots of times where I go three or four weeks, not write a song, and then maybe get three songs in a week or something like that. But, but I'm pretty much year round trying to stay, stay with it. So do you average 50 songs a year then? Uh, that would be a low year for me, but yeah. Yeah. Well, that's why I was saying, I was uh, wondering how the hell you'd pick out songs, you know, for this, we're just going to have to have like a monthly TC episode or something you know? <laughs> this month with TC Elliott. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, I mean, going back to something, I don't remember where, which, which episode you were talking about it in, but, um, getting better. Um, like, like everybody knows the more you do it, the better you get, but it's really, it's really not that easy. I mean, that does work. And that's what I did for a long time. I just wrote tons of songs and eventually I got a little better. But what I found is if you don't have purpose in writing songs, if you don't have, if you're not trying to get better while you're writing more songs, you end up just writing the same song over and over. It might be a different song. It might be a different key, might be different, whatever, but it's the same song over and over again. Like it's the same style lyric or the same quality lyric. It's the same, you know, are you really going out of, out of this key? Are you adding modulations? Are you doing anything to make it unique or new or, you know, what did you learn through the song? And, and it's perfectly okay. One of the songs that I, I just wrote, I really like, and it's pretty, pretty standard. I really like the song. It's one of my favorite songs, but, but it's, it's not out of the box. But I don't know if I didn't push myself in other ways if I could have gotten to that song. So, so I think the, the counter argument to that is people say, when say like a favorite band um, changes up their music, um, they get a lot of negative feedback from their diehards. It's like this isn't the band we liked. Why don't you yeah. change? And then there's a contingent to where you know if you're like an ACDC or a Tom Petty and all your albums are basically the same right i mean you know there there's an audience for that and there's also people that don't like that so uh it sounds like you lean more towards wanting to change uh be more dynamic uh, and just to see what you can learn and get better from i would say yes um i don't know i i completely hear what you're saying as far as um your audience and building your audience and and I think that I think the audience doesn't want the same thing over and over again, but they don't want too quick of a change. So, you know, if you're like in Tom Petty, if you look, listen to the beginning of the Heartbreakers and you listen where he ended, I mean, that's a pretty good jump. Um, it, it's pretty diverse. But to get there was a real nice, gentle slope. Right. And the problem you get into is if you got like if you're doing like I've got some. I call it post-punk, but it's just hard rock and a lot of those songs. And it's um, so I'm not going to get into po politics at all, but it's libertarian leaning. So it's kind of a project side project. And I put a lot of my hard rock stuff into that, but I keep it completely separate from what I try to do as TC Elliott, because I don't want to, first of all, I don't want to alienate good people because I'm, I'm a libertarian calling Republican and Democrats, both names, or at least pointing out the inconsistencies. I do that shit all the time, man. Go for it. But so there's a place for that. And then the other part is, you know, I don't want to I don't necessarily think that going from pretty hard uh, to kind of folk rock is necessarily a good or a bad thing. But for me, it usually doesn't flow. So if I'm picking out songs, I'm like, oh, these are my 10 or 12 favorite songs. But if I listen to them and it doesn't work together for whatever reason, then I'm not going to put them together. Now, that being said, I've only I've I've got lots of songs I could put out and, and lots of different kind of styles. But mainly I'm a folk rocker that leans a little bit more to the rock on sometimes and a little bit more to the folk on sometimes. And I like doing countryish or alt country stuff and I like doing other stuff. But really, that's my lane. And it's um, it's to me, it's not that different. Most like most of what I do. But listening back like somebody on song fight said, Oh, he does country stuff every once in a while. And I couldn't play country if my life depended on it, but go back and listen to it. And I understand what they're saying. Cause it is kind of an alt country kind of a, I, like I could aim for Sarah shook and the disarmers. If I could do nail that, I would do that. I would put a band, a local band together and do that, that alt country twang, but it's not top 40 at all. 
I would love to do that, but I'm just not good enough. Now, if I got a band together, I would love to do that. So I, I don't know. I don't think that answers the question, but. I don't even remember what the question was, (laughs) but I'm I'm just enjoying the conversation. Do you, uh, are you playing any bands right now? No, not for several years. Like, I don't know. It's been like five or six years. Um, I had a all original band. We did one cover um, on all original band and I really liked the songs. It was kind of a nineties rock or an all rock feel, but not really. Um, the bass player was phenomenal. The drummer was pretty good. And then the singer is a good friend of mine, Travis um, and life, you know how it is. Life gets in the way and, and uh, it just, it was, you know, let's go on hiatus. And that was, I don't know, six years ago or something, maybe longer now. I don't know. And, and that I, I've kind of toyed with the idea of being in a band several times. I, I do, uh, the, I'm part of the NSAI, NSAI uh, local song circle and there's musicians and, you know, had offers and, and no people. I mean, I could probably get a band together fairly quickly, you know, you know, that process isn't ever fast, but you know, I know enough people that I could probably get some jams going and something could come of it, but I love it. And I hate it at the same time. I guess that brings up, I've got severe stage fright too. So I've been in bands a lot, you know, over the last 20 years, but well, 15 of those 20 years, um, several cover bands, original band play some open mics, but I mean, I've got severe stage fright. So now do you have stage fright? on stage or just the pre-stage anxiety because i you know um if if i have to get on the stage for any reason i'm fine once i'm up there you know i just kind of it's like a rolling stone it's getting on like taking the steps up to the stage is is where i get the maybe i shouldn't do this this was a bad idea but once i get going i'm like this is the best idea ever yeah i don't enjoy it um Sometimes I enjoy it, but I, I basically don't enjoy performing. Um, I think I should do it more. And when I do it more regularly, it does get manageable. Um, but I, it's definitely leading up to it. Like I get physically ill. Um, and it took me a while to figure it out. I was in this cover band and we were playing, you know, we we're playing. Well, it was basically classic rock cover band, but we played, you know, Foo Fighters and I don't know, all sorts of stuff, a green day song. And I mean, it, it was, it was a pretty good range and it, it was three sets of 12 songs and we could rotate out a little bit. And there's a couple of originals in there, but, but basically it was, you know, a three hour gig with a couple of 15 minute breaks. And we played, you know, it seemed like our, our key was uh, the bar in the basement of a hotel. That was our kind of gig and people loved it. I mean, we did, and we played a New Year's Eve gig that was awesome. I mean, I mean, it it goes to your head. And I'd be lying if I didn't say I didn't have moments that I enjoyed in doing that. And doing it steadily, it did get better. But but it's hard. And you know, not resorting to alcohol is hard when your nerves are going up and you know that if you hit a shot or two that you're gonna instantly feel a little better, but then you don't know if you make a mistake, you know, halfway through your night. So it's like. I don't know. It, it's just, it's definitely something that I've dealt with. I can deal with, I should be dealing with more, but um, it, it's, it's not easy. And it's, it's, it's enough to say if I'm on the fence on um, whether I want the time to write and record and do this type of thing more versus going out and spending that time practicing and playing and getting a band tight and trying to do all that in the local scene, which you know, local bands, especially original music, local bands. I mean, you know, that's, that's painful. Even if you enjoy it, that's painful. You know, trying to make anything of it is, is, is difficult. And it's like, is it worth the pain and the effort? And I think it is, it's, you know, part of it also is procrastination and laziness, but I, there's no, I will say this, there's nothing like getting a band together and, and being in a band. There is nothing like that. Like you can't re- reproduce that in front of a microphone and by yourself. There's just no way. Even if you, if I have somebody else here and we're bouncing ideas, and but we're tracking maybe at most two of us at one time, there's, it's not the same. And I do miss that. Um, do you ever do any of uh, those fall over parties and play anything there? Um, no, uh, I did go to Falmstock one year 
And I did have a couple of meetups when Helen came in. I think it was her second trip to the States. She came in. One of her legs was into Kansas City or, well, St. Joseph, Missouri. Um, and I went up. She she stopped and uh, visited, I think, with Mal. And then I went up and got her. She spent a night or two here. And then we drove up to Chicago or outside Chicago. And we met uh, Nancy Ross, um, John Crossman, um, Das Binky. I'm sure I'm gonna leave somebody out and man, I'd feel like to really terrible. Us, Binky, man, that would rock. He's cool. He's well, they're all cool. Um, so, and then my wife was with us, and so we were, you know, a couple of motel hotel rooms, and we wrote a couple of songs, and um, so I, I have been, I've had kind of that experience, but I've never really been to a farm over party where it's actually after farm and you get, we just wrote these songs, let's do something, um. I do participate in song fight fairly regularly, um, especially over the last couple of years. And a year ago, August, I went up to Madison for song fight live and I got to see Nancy and um, I missed um, John and a couple of the other ones, but uh, I met Al from Fom. She's a song fighter um, and a, actually a bunch of other people. Um, it was absolutely, it was, it was killer. And in that experience, and, and I don't think um, Al had the slightest idea, but she asked, uh, so she's got a band, Gentle Brontosaurus, and the guitar player couldn't make it. So she had a set that she wanted to play. And she was like, on the boards of Song Fight, they were like, hey, we're doing this, you know, if anybody needs help, you know, I'm willing to help this, that, and the other. You know, and I was like, you know, if I can help out, yeah, no big deal. Well, Al asked me, he said, hey, will you play guitar on these songs? We're going to have this practice and then we'll play. I'm like, yeah, I'll do that. No, I haven't played in a band five years at this point, you know, and now here I'm playing guitar and with people I've never met in person. So I no problem. Then she goes, hey, the practice might be a little bit less, you know, on Friday. There's some stuff come up, but, you know, we'll do a practice and then we'll do the set. No problem. We get there. She's like, yeah, no practice. We're just going to play the set. So here I am, you know, unbeknownst to her, I've got stage fright the size of Milwaukee hanging over my head and get up there. And it's the most, I mean, I absolutely love, I was nervous, but I loved it. Playing that, playing live, playing guitar and in a band and playing off of each other. Man, there is nothing like it. I, I don't, I can't describe the twin feelings of stage fright and playing in a band that fight against each other. It's like the, I don't know, the good wolf and the bad wolf and whichever one you feed. Well, I'm feeding both of them. It's crazy. So <laughs> that's exciting. I've never been to any of the uh farm stocks or farm over parties. I've I've met a few. Charlie's traveled through, you know, he's a, a globe trotter. I've housed Charlie at least twice, if not three times. And he did a performance. We had a barbecue at my house and uh, you know, friends came over and, and he he did giant chicken and uh so, pie and that kind of stuff and it, it was great time and uh I took him to the, like the local civil war military park which was great um met debs she came down to one of my brother's weddings um oh man have i met any other ones i think those are the only ones from out of town um i should have met uh what's his name pitzel stefan Oh, yeah. Yeah, I should have met him because we literally lived like 20 minutes apart when I lived in Covington, Louisiana. I'm in Mississippi now in the central. I'm in Clinton now, so I'm a little farther away. I don't think I'm too close to any farmers right now, but would love to have a meetup when, you know, we're allowed to do such things. Um, yeah, so that, that's pretty cool. Now, do you have relationships just you know, personal relationships with, with farmers that have nothing to do with music. You guys are just friends because you're friends. Oh, um, that's a hard question. I don't know. I don't think I've ever thought of it that way. I, I would say, um, Nancy, Nancy Ross. So, um, my wife and I would go up to Madison and watch the bottle rockets play at Kiki's basement. Um, which is a thing. Um, so the Bottle Rockets are my favorite band. I actually have their shirt on right now. Um, they're out of based out of St. Louis. 
Um, so yeah, I, I, I know like if that was a dart team or what when you had it on there. I was like the Bottle Rockets Athletic Club. I don't get it. Yeah, it's uh, and, and side note, it's like the third or fourth time Madison's been mentioned on the show. By the way, yeah. Well, it wasn't. Um, yeah, so it wasn't Burr in Madison when all this bomb stuff started. I'm, I, I think, think so. Yeah. At least some of them were. Maybe it was, or the Destods up there. I don't know. So uh, somebody like that's up in Madison. Charlie was in Madison, I believe. Yeah, so I remember Nancy saying that on one of the first uh, compilation albums where they had submissions and stuff, she worked on it with Kiki. Like there was actual local people working on that. And so Madison was kind of an epicenter, sort of, um, even if I've got all my facts mixed up, but it, there was a lot of people there as kind of a, kind of a hub. Um, so Fom, the farm stock I went to was outside of Madison. And that was the first time I'd ever been in Wisconsin or went up there. And then the bottle rockets were going up there and, and uh, several years ago. And my wife and I were like, well, it's only like six and a half, seven hours away. So why don't we drive up there? you know, one day watch the show and drive back the next day. So, you know, Saturday, Sunday. And while we're there, I'm like, yeah, let's see if Nancy and John and, you know, if anybody else wants to do lunch or something. And so that's what we did. And then it seemed like every other year they were playing in the fall, ball rockets were, so we would go up there. And so um, like John Crossman and I hit it off. We don't talk that much. We really don't, but we hit it off really well. Um, Nancy, I, we, Nancy hoops and I had, um, a FOM band or an internet band called uh, the Rot Band, um, which started with Nancy mistyping her last name instead of Rost, it was Rot. And so she did like five songs, 150, 90. And I was like, hey, I want to do that. So I was, I ended up being Tommy Rot. And Hoops was several people in the band. And um, so I call her my Rot Band sis. And I feel really close, like outside of music. Like we don't do that many collaborations. We did one in 5090, but, um, but you know, she's, she's friend. She's as close to family as you can be with somebody that you don't talk to very often. And, and, you know, internet friend and, and all that. And I would say Das Binkies and John Crossman and you know, like, there's several people um, that kind of go in and out maybe that I feel pretty close to. Um, Hoops was one of those people we would sit in the chat room off and on for, for hours at times. And, and we'd argue sometimes. I mean, it, it was almost like brothers. It was, Hoops it was would crazy. argue with you. you know, oh man, I can't <laughs> believe it. That's hard to believe that Hoops would argue. I, I'm pretty argumentative to begin with. And no, um, no, no, yeah. definitely not. No. And that probably came across in the chat room more often than it should have. Well, the trouble with the chat is you have no idea what tone they're putting on your words. You know, that's the trouble with text messaging. I would say, yeah, I think in the chat, it was a, at least the chat for Fom, it was a little better because there were misunderstandings and there were times when heated and people upset. I mean, all that stuff that happens on the Internet definitely happened there. But I think a lot less than it probably should have considering. Um, but I think maybe I'm skewed a little bit because of the amount of time I was spending in the chat. If I was doing something on computer wise, I had to chat off to the side like all the time. And so, so for me, even if I wasn't participating, I, I had that thing on, especially in 2008, 2009, 2010, it was on quite a bit. Um, I remember having one of the most deeply philosophical question, uh, discussions I've ever had with Charlie Cheney in the chat room, just the two of us on off season. Charlie's a national treasure, man. That dude is a philosopher, author, writer, programmer, yeah. promoter, tour, nature, -er, all the errors. I mean, that dude to me is like, you know, I don't know, free. Like he's the most free person I've ever met. And he makes good salsa. If you've never had his salsa. <laughs> I've never had the salsa. Uh, he sent me some jars of salsa before and um, it was most excellent. Yeah, he's good people. And I would say we probably differ quite a bit um, just in, I don't want to say philosophy, but in in outlook. Um, but he's, I mean, when you find somebody that is willing to discuss something, maybe even that we disagree on, but and like, and I remember in that, I don't even remember most of that conversation. It was so long ago, but 
But I remember in the feeling in that conversation how we were kind of at odds, but we were trying to feel it out and try to find not necessarily common ground, but trying to understand and get to a place where we could understand each other. And, you know, you know, listening to some of the like I was just listening to the um, Applehead, uh, Stephen Wesley Giles episode this week. And, you know, that's not that's not always common that you listen to understand, which is uh, something that you two were talking about, where instead of trying to, you know, waiting your turn to get your point across or trying to make your point and trying to convince somebody. And, and you can't do that on the Internet. You really can't. I mean, very rarely does that happen. And I, I consider the Internet and Facebook and all that just an echo chamber. And, yeah, there's dissent. Yeah. There's people that Silo. are going to. Tr- yeah. What's that? Silos, you know, you go yeah. on whatever silo you're comfortable with. And when they cross, it's like. an. Ex- yeah, but like on Facebook, I mean, there's lots of people will come in and tell you how wrong you are or whatever. I mean, there is that anti, but it's not in a sense to understand. It's just to get their point across. Like it's just basically one big argument. And I, I've gotten to the point where I've got friends, local friends that I've unfollowed just because they post about politics. And some of them are what I believe. So it's yeah, that that sucks. Right. When somebody you try to support, it just makes you feel bad about it. Uh, like, I don't mind people posting about politics, but I'm with you, you know, like uh, we, if you post about it to me, that's an invitation to have a discussion, not a flame war, but I, you know, I, I literally asked somebody a question. Like I was, I was genuine about wanting to learn. Cause I figure if they have a opinion, there's some reason they have that opinion. I don't assume somebody's a jerk cause we disagree. And I was like, you know, why is this blah, blah, blah. And um, like, I like got turned on, like I was like, trolling them or something i'm like i was just having trying to have a conversation but uh yeah i got off of facebook a long time ago for that and you know i just do instagram now and a little twitter mainly is promotion uh twitter has its issues too but for what i use it for it's fine yeah i i'm still on facebook but i've focused 90 percent of my time on the tc elliott music page um yeah, I use then, my wife's account to manage my music page. That's nice. I have a music page, but I like I said, I just I just use her account for that. I don't have a personal. And then Instagram, I like Instagram, but I found that I never was on it. So just I, I'd say probably the beginning of the year, I've I've made an effort to do um, Instagram and Facebook posts on my music page every day. I think I missed one day so far this year. But I'm trying to, even if it's just something funny, like something that I would post on my regular account, but ah, I don't have the time or don't want to or whatever. So I try to post something every every day, just some something consistent that usually doing with music, usually um, just trying. And it's it's not really marketing, but it's just, you know, the the key to getting your music out and having people listen to it is just consistency, I think. And it's like if they only hear from you every once in a while, first of all, the Facebook algorithm is not going to show your stuff to anybody. And then second of all, if they haven't heard from you in a long time and then you're begging them to listen or buy, then you're not, there's not a relationship. That's not any way to get somebody to support you or you support them or have an interest, you know, and, and that's fine. If that's, if that's what you want to do, it's fine, but don't be surprised at the end of the day when you've got two people listening to your band camp album and, and that's it. And I, I don't, I don't want to make money. I mean, I, I will make my, I'll take the money, but that's not, I want people to listen to my music and I want to get better. And I want to make, you know, I want, I want people to like, like John Staples has been awesome. He's, he's, there's been two songs that he's mentioned and gone out of his way to tell me that he really appreciated and liked they meant something to him. And, and, you know, that by itself over the last, and over the last years, four years, and those that two comments from one guy is enough to keep me going. Yeah, I'm gonna do this music thing, you know. It, and there's been other people too, but those dopamine hits yeah. of uh, affirmation. Uh, I'm I'm with you on that, man. Um, and it, it was one of my earlier shows with a, a guy called World Not Gray, and um, well, we've kept working together since then. We actually have a song coming out together and another song coming out together, and we just have a good relationship. And uh, I'm trying to get him on phone. I think I almost got him there. Um, but he, I was talking to him and I noticed how he had an account that was like maybe a year old, but had 4,000 followers already. And this is just a dude down in Barbados, not touring, 
you know, not known for anything worldwide or anything, you know, he's literally like us. And I was like, you know, how, how does that happen? How do you get, you know, 4,000 organic followers? He's like, I just start chatting with people and ask them, you know, their motivation and what, you know, what do you think? And then, and I realized that's exactly how he and I started talking. He messaged me and was like, Hey, why do you do this show? What do you, you know, want? And we just started talking about it. And I'm like, you should be on the show. And then I followed him and I'm like, Oh yeah. And so yeah. I've done my best to adopt that style. Um, of trying to have, you know, meaningful dialogue with people, not just promotional material. Yeah. And yeah, I post something fun for just to be a participant in the crowd, not just, Hey, my new album's out, right. my new album's out, my new album's out. Um, I mean, you know, obviously I promote my music over at gslade.com with this podcast, but that doesn't mean that's all I do. You know, uh, that's gslade.com. But um no, yeah, I, I agree with you. And it's more fun to build the relationships on a personal level to me because um, they're even if they don't like something, sometimes you can get some good feedback from people. Whereas if it's just a artist fan relationship, they're either going to listen or not. There's no dialogue. That's what I thing I love about Instagram is you can you can channel a ton of content there. Uh, pictures and stuff. People can engage in pictures, right? They love pictures and videos and sound. But then you can also engage in dialogue there. And that's why I think it's great. And you can't put, you know, hyperlinks in the post and all that, which cuts down on a lot of spam and whatnot. You got to go to the bio, right? Yeah. Uh, so that's really cool. And um, I think that was my whole thought. I can't remember <laughs> my whole thought there. But you were right about the Stephen Wesley Giles episode. To me, that was a perfect example of two guys that know what they have in common and, and why they're talking and what they can bond about, which was the music for for uh for him and for me but you know we're polar opposites when it comes to like spirituality and things like that but it made for really to me a great conversation instead of a contentious one i mean and hopefully the listeners feel the same way yeah i think that i i for me i'm so burnt out on politics right now that it was and so the way i listen to your podcast is the radio went out in my truck um like it just won't even turn on. Well, every once in a while it'll come on for like three seconds and blare. I can't get the volume to go down because it's off before I can get to it. So I've been literally plugging my iPhone with a adapter cord, not even Bluetooth into a little, you know, wireless speaker. And I got about 15 minutes on the way to work and about 20 minutes on the way back from work. And so I've been listening to the podcast like basically one a week. You know, yeah, I was going to say it would take you about a week to get through an episode. It's, it's two uh, and a half, three hours an episode. So I'm sitting here, you know, at a half an hour a day, roughly or less, a little over a half an hour a day listening to it in bits. And I got I got to work and. Man, the whole the whole trip was politics and it was like I found myself doing exactly what you guys were talking about, getting riled up. And it was like I didn't disagree with either one of you, but I was still getting riled up. And it was just, you know what I mean? It's just, it was just politics. And it was like, Ugh. so I'm get to work. I sit there and I'm going to listen for a few more minutes. And so I, I stayed in the, in the truck, maybe 90 seconds. It wasn't very long. And I was like, all right, that's it. I hit pause. I got out of it. And then I came back and I was like, oh, I really want to hear this episode. But I'm sick of the politics. Like it didn't matter what you said. You could have been all libertarian all day. You could have been all right. You could have been all, it did not matter. I was sick of it. I didn't want to hear it. And then I plugged in and there it went and it something clicked. And I was like, okay, this is a good, you know, it kind of clicked with me. I was in the right frame. I was awake enough to understand that it's not about me, that I was putting my shit, my bullshit into a conversation that was perfectly reasonable, completely open-minded, completely understanding. And that was me. And it's like, how many times have I gone on Facebook or on social media and been in that mindset and responded? It's like, I was, I was the asshole. Like I'm calling somebody an asshole for what they're doing. I was the asshole and didn't even realize it. Even if I was more polite or even if I was, I don't know, it, it's, it's tough. But that being said, you having that conversation. And like you said, religion, religion wise, religious wise, being polar opposites, but having that conversation, that's what we have to do. We, it doesn't matter if it's about music, politics, religion, doesn't matter what it's about. Anytime, like no two people are identical. So the way you do it is you have the conversation and you seek to understand somebody else. 
And once you do that, if you're listening to understand where they come from, even if you're trying to understand so you can better argue against them, that's still plausible. That's okay. As long as you're seeking to understand, because then you have a better grasp of where you're coming from and you have a better idea of what it is that you have in common and what you don't have in common. It's a byproduct. That's yeah. my approach is actually, I want you to change my mind. Like I literally, because if you can, if we can have a conversation and I literally look at it differently, obviously you had a compelling viewpoint. I usually assume that the odds are against me being quote unquote, correct. Right. And in a lot of things, there is no correct. There's, it's all subjective. There's, you know, yeah. uh, without getting too philosophical, there's no objective truth, right? It's all, your perception tc's world g slade's world whatever you know to us what we see and interpret is the real world to us so we could think something is fairly obvious and to someone else it's completely ridiculous so i am actually looking for what you'd call like a paradigm shift you know anytime i'm talking to somebody i disagree with or don't and usually i don't even want to say disagree a lot of times sometimes i just don't understand yeah. their point of view but I think of it as food as well. You know, uh, there's foods that like I say I hadn't tried or I don't like, or I don't understand why I don't like it, but there's millions of people that eat it. So it must not be bad. So let me give it a shot. Cause if millions of people like it, you know, maybe I'll like it. And I think if you take uh, philosophy on whether it's politics, religion, music, literature, raising children, whatever, you know, if you approach it in that sense that, well, there's millions of people that feel this way. There's a reason for it. Some something connects with somebody on an emotional level that makes them think this way and support this viewpoint. Um, and yeah, you, you can't argue with anybody you don't understand. It's like literally impossible to have an effective discussion if you don't understand the person. And you can't do that in a little post on Facebook or a tweet. You know, it takes a long form. And, and Stephen and I, I don't think we had any contentious moments at all, regardless of whether we agreed or not. And for one, I'm not going to like try to be combative towards anyone on my show. That would just be, <laughs> right. it's not that tight. It's not like a, a, you know, political talk point show or anything like that. It's a music show. We're here mm -hmm. for the music. And uh, literally, I don't even care if I like the music. If, you know, you're doing your thing and you're an indie artist and I support you. And uh, yeah, we need more conversations like that in general, regardless of what the topic is. Um, I think we see that the same way. No, oh, yeah. I, I think most people see that and it's just so easy. I don't want to say most people see that. I think it's too easy to get wrapped up in our self to lose sight of what's important. And whether that's with family members like like Stephen was talking about or, you know, on the Internet, it's even worse because, you know, for some reason, being behind a keyboard changes our ability to exercise common courtesy and it just i don't know i having those types of conversations i think are very important but they're very hard to do first of all it takes a lot of time um you know in today's world it's hard to have that conversation then you, you add the internet on top of it and it's it makes it even harder you know something like this face to face or in a chat room even like you were talking about it's easy to misunderstand each other in the chat room but even that's better than just posting on a, on social media because yeah i mean in the farm chat though i think we give each other the benefit of the doubt because we're all yeah. farmers and that's a yeah. great way to approach it like give people the benefit of the doubt assume they're not an asshole right yeah. <laughs> assume that you guys like let and, and you know you're talking about seek to understand and then seek to be understood and that was one of stephen covey's principles another one of his principles was um and i just forgot it while i was talking my brain does this every show i forget something <laughs> Oh, what man, I hate this. I do that all the time. I had an MRI this year and they told me I had brain atrophy, so I'm starting to believe it. Uh, so that's fun. So, um, I don't think you're yeah. alone in that, <laughs> right? No, I'm def probably definitely not, but um, I, I, I'm alone in how it affects me, so uh, right, <laughs> right. I was, I had a really good point here, too. Oh, giving people the benefit of the doubt was where. It, I started this thought with, and then it kind of died. Um, oh, figure out what you agree on first, right? Oh, yeah. Like understand what you agree on and build on that. And, and then I think you can work better together. That was, so that was I, it. I don't know where I read it or who said it or what, but um, it might've been Thomas Sowell. A pl it was political 
somebody who's yeah, I've read like five of his books. I'm very familiar with him. Yeah, so I love Thomas Sowell. But um I think he was the one, but it could have be somebody else. I don't know. But they were talking about well, so I just did what you did. What was I was going to talk about? It was in I'm an sorry. argument. Oh, you have to be able to in order to really have a debate, it's an argument unless you can restate somebody else's position in a way they will agree with before you debate it. Because what happens in politics in general, like politics, and, and when I talk about left and right, I'm usually talking about politicians, and I have a really bad opinion of all politicians. I don't care what politician. If it's your politician, my pol they are all, I, I have a really low opinion of them. But what they do is they straw man everything. It's you're either with me or you're against me attitude. And there is no incentive in Washington to come to a solution. But that's also, I mean, in my personal life, I've noticed that I kind of act that way sometimes too, where I'm trying to get my point. You got to understand how I feel. You got to understand what I think. No, this is the right way of doing it instead of understanding where somebody's coming from. Well, the way to do that is restate their opinion, their argument, their position in a way they would agree with. And if you can't do that, then you don't understand their position. If you, if you can't do that, then you're arguing at cross purposes. And like some of the biggest debates in our time, um, abortion, gun control, and all these things that I do not want to talk about, most of the arguments, the typical left-right argument, they're arguing different, different points. They're not arguing the point. Somebody else, one, you're talking about this right, and somebody's talking about a different right. And th there's no way to resolve that until you understand that you're arguing different things. And both of those things can be true at the same time. And typically in an argument, you're trying to say, this is true. No, this is true. Well, they can both be true. You have to figure out how that works together as a society. And then you yeah. have politicians telling you, no, this, 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 and this. And then, it, and then social media on top of that, uh, I'm surprised we get along at all. It's crazy. No, I'm, I'm completely with you on that point. I mean, I, I think uh, no matter what side of an issue you're on, you know, I think people, um, you know, on either side of gun control, both value life and they just see the means of protecting life differently. But they both value life. No one's out there going, we should kill people. You know, right. pe no, I don't think anyone's out there going human life doesn't matter. You know, I think everybody thinks that, you know, so yeah, it's completely just a value system and it's really the angle you take. Uh, but that's a great segue, man, uh, into talking about some of your songs, which we hadn't even started talking about yet. Uh, and we've been talking for an hour. I don't know if you realize that. I did notice that, but I'll, <laughs> I'll talk all day. I'm me to too, me too. But I, <laughs> I, I was thinking about the uh, listeners. I'm like, yeah, right. they might want to hear a song. Um, and, and believe me, uh, we're not going to shoehorn them all in if it's not natural. We're going to talk about whatever comes up. But you know, still, let's uh, let's hit up a song or two here. So the first one I got queued up is called uh, "Whichever, Whenever." And um, if you can remember uh, why you wrote that song and what it's about in the midst of all of your songwriting, uh, I'd love to hear the backstory on that one. Um, so that's a co-write with Amanda K. Williams, who's uh, on Falm in 5090 is at NAMA 17. Um, I think she's on social media as Fender Bender or something or other. Um, so, and it's a song fight title that... Um, I actually took a note on this one so I could remember. So I'm going to read it. March 30th, 2019 was when that fight was due. So way back in, a year, uh, I guess, almost two years ago now. Um, and we'd been writing some songs together during Falm in 5090 for, uh, I think, two years. Um, and then somebody on the board, I was complaining about all my, I don't even know what I was complaining about. And somebody said, well, you know, you could have a guest or you could you know, have a co-writer, you can collaborate. And I'm like, Hey, that's a great idea. Why didn't I think of that? And so I asked her. And so we started doing song fight entries together as uh, evil grin. And, um, this one, she wrote the lyric to, um, I'm trying to remember if she wrote most of the music or not. I don't think she wrote most of the music, but, um, the guitar part seems to be something I would play. So on our collaborations, it's usually a true collaboration. Sometimes it's a lyric and then I'll music, you know, add the music or vice versa. Um, sometimes it's music first. So sometimes it is separate. But on this one, uh, the lyric went back and forth through a Google Doc. We, we went back and forth and, and it was more of what I call a true collaboration. Not that there isn't a all 
sorts that they're all, not all of them are true, but we worked on pretty much everything together through the song. Um, but it's mainly her lyric, um, her melody. Um, and we put it together and it really, I really like the song a lot. It's, it's got a little bit of a drive to it. It still has that acoustic behind it. Um, we had a comment on song fight where they talk and it was a really positive spin. And I thought it was more of a negative spin on it until I got that comment, you know, reading through the lyric and I definitely see where they, they came from with it. But it was one of those songs that really meant something to me, even though factually the lyric wasn't, you know, factually correct. It was still true about, you know, I think we all go through being kind of caught in a maze or being caught in a, in a needing help, that type of thing, and not having a straight relationship. In other words, it's not a cut and dried relationship trying to get help or offering help and all of that stuff. And that all, to me, that's what's in this song. And, and all that being said that when the listener listens to the song, they determine what it really means for them. So what I think it means can change, even though I may be a co-writer on the song and it may be different from somebody else, but, but that came from a collaboration in a, in a place that it really, it, it really meant something to me. It, it struck a chord with me, which I think is, you know, that's what I want music that I'm a fan of to do. So it was pretty cool to have one that I co-wrote with somebody off season outside of farm um, and work really well. Well, um, I used to listen to all the songs people sent me ahead of time and make notes. And I thought, you know what, I'm just going to do natural reactions to it. So if I come up with any special meaning for it while I'm listening, I'll let you know. Um, but yeah, we'll play it. And we're not playing from Spotify on this episode like we've done from uh, a lot of others. So you just get to look at our pretty faces and then hear the music because I, mean, I could share the VLC player. But, you know, like mm -hmm. it's not very exciting. Right. Uh, Anyways, but we'll play it. This is whichever, whenever, uh, T.C. Elliott and uh, what was her name, Amanda? Amanda Williams. I don't I I kind of remember that FOM name. You know, it's like Amanda backwards or something. And yeah. with the numbers, I don't think we've worked together. I'm sure I've commented on her stuff or something. But uh, all right, we're going to play the song and uh, we'll just kind of like awkwardly bob our heads, you know, and then we'll be right back. And the dark of the night I'm ready 
All right, we're back. That was good, man. I enjoyed it. Um, so why didn't you throw down on the vocals, man? Um, anytime I can get out of singing, I do. I'm with you there, man. My voice uh, sounds really weird. I don't know if you listened. Uh, did you listen to January's episode? Yeah. I think. No, it wasn't that his episode. It was the, um, I think it was Breath's episode where I said the, um, you know, I don't know what episode it was. Could have been Breath, could have been Despair Jordan. I have no idea. But I said, if you uh, want to get used to your own voice, just host a podcast and about 60 hours in, you know, you'll be used to it. But singing's yep. that way too. It's like, oh, I don't know, man. It sounds really funky. Yep. Um, doing Fallman 5090 and just mixing so many songs, even if it was just real quick stuff, got me used to. And I don't know where, how many years ago, but I used to record this way. So I have my microphone have one off so I could hear myself stay in tune kind of here and then have the music in the other side. And anymore, I, I should still do that because I do a better job with that anymore. I've improved to the point where I'm still my same old crappy level without having to do that. So I think if I did that, I could actually improve and maybe for, be on. for people just listening on Spotify, what he's talking about is leaving one ear uncovered so you can hear your voice more naturally. Cause even if you're monitoring that delay messes me up, you know, cause if you turn the, um, what's the delay Late, called? Latency. The, uh, latency. Yeah. If you turn the latency all the way down, you got to have a hell of a processor on your PC to handle that. So typically you're still going to have a little latency, especially if you have any effect on your voice. Right. And so, yeah, if you take that, if you uncover that one ear, you can hear your voice more naturally which is why I kind of quit wearing the headphones for these, these podcasts, because I had this muffled like two, three hour conversation where I hear you clearly. And I'm just like, wah, 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 you yeah. know? Uh, so, yeah, but that's what he's talking about for people on like Spotify listening, uh, uncovering one ear. So, yeah, but yeah, if I can get away with just not singing, uh, it's fine. Uh, I'm always like trying to figure out how I should sing, um, was that hard for you to figure out? Did you figure out pretty early? Um, and I don't mean I, like how to sing, but I mean how you should sing, right? You know, like your wheel. Yeah, I think I'm. So it it was a process. Um, and I think I'm still, I think we all do. We're still learning, right? Like it's a never ending process to get better and improve and be at the very least be more consistent. But um one, I can't remember. It was a song fight song. I have no idea which one, but I sang and I, I'm lazy. So yeah, I'm, I'm taking song fight. So if you don't know what song fight is, they post a, a title and then 10 days later, you, you send it in 10 days later, anybody on the internet can come vote for it. And whoever gets the most vote wins absolutely nothing, but it's on the internet forever. Right. And so I'm, this is how lazy I am. I will do a song and not fix stuff because I'm too lazy. That's going to be on the internet forever. You know? And one of those, I was in a rush, too lazy to do 13 more vocal takes to get a good take and just send it in. And somebody said, hey, the vocals are really good, you know. And I was like, what? That, no, you know. And I go back and listen to it. I'm like, you know, that wasn't too bad. And that gave me the confidence to actually start paying attention and improving my vocal. I was just resigned to being mediocre at best. I was like, I was not working on vocal technique singing um and now i get i got to the point where like before like if i'd put like reattune on uh, tuner on something it would be like every other note or this whole phrase or whatever and it got to the point where i've got to pick out the couple of notes that are off enough and i will say that i do like i don't like perfect vocals anyway or perfect takes i like leaving mistakes in and for a while, that was a crutch. It was an excuse. Oh, I just like leaving mistakes in. So it, it, that's my excuse to be crappy, you know, to ha have mistakes, not be good enough, not to do three more takes or whatever it takes. But there's something about, and I think you were talking to um, Stephen about that as well. I just listened to that episode. So that's why I keep bringing them up. But um, talking about um, the, the process, the, the, um, you know, not being perfect, I guess, 
going through and having it feel right. Like he was re-recording, I can't remember the name of the song, but the rocking song he was doing and, and getting that, you don't want to lose the feel. So, I don't know. I just, vocally, that gave me the incentive to try to do better. And then as I try to do better, the more I try, the worse it got in a way. So it's one of those things that you have to try to do better just by letting yourself be free. Like the more you try, the more tight you get, the worse it is. If that makes sense. Vocally, that's completely true for me. So it's one of those things where you have to get better and practice and do these things so that when it comes time, you have to be relaxed so you have the best technique. And that's very hard for me to figure out. Vocally, it's, I don't know. I just, I, I try to get better. I, I have gotten better. I hear that I've gotten better, but it's still not anywhere close to where it, I think I would be confident to be the singer in the band or whatever, even though I think that would probably be the best thing I could ever do is get a live band, be the singer and just do it. I, I would improve so much quick, more quickly and, and be better for it, be a better musician for it if I did that. And I don't want to, but that would be best. All right. Let me like rewind. So anyway, based on what I've heard from your vocals, I think you'd do all right in like a Tom Petty style delivery, you know, where he was like, you know, she grew up, you know what I mean? Like he wasn't like, ah, or doing any like Steven Tyler stuff, you know, like I could do Tom Petty at karaoke and it was acceptable to drunk people in Vicksburg right. or even Brett Michaels, you know, in Poison. Like he, he wasn't like wowing anybody with vocals, you know what I mean? He kind of had a deep voice that he knew how to use. So I think you could be a lead. Like that's, that's what I meant by like, finding out how you should sing. Like if I go out and try to sing Queen, it's going to sound awful, right? I can't do Freddie yeah. Mercury. I can't even sing Brian May. Brian May, very underrated <laughs> vocalist. But um, I can, I figured out, you know, especially like this last film, I was like, let me just experiment. I did this like, you know, vocal distortion and hey, and all this stuff, like James Hetfield, Lemmy type stuff, you know? And I was like, hey, that's, that's kind of in my element there. And uh, so that's what I mean by figuring out how you should sing, uh, not necessarily how to sing. Yeah, I, I don't know. I still, I, it's, it's still a mystery to me. I'll go through, um, like at one point I realized that I have a, a little bit higher pitched voice. Maybe that's not even, but it's just, uh, so Robert Cray, maybe if you know who Robert Cray is, blues guitar player, singer, he's got a pretty high, clear voice. And I, you know, I was, I, I played guitar to a lot of uh, blues albums and stuff when I was first figuring out how to play. And it wasn't until Robert, I mean, you know, it, I didn't sound like any of them. I couldn't sing the blues, not that I would be able to anyway, but when Robert, when I discovered Robert Cray, I was like, Hey, I can sing like that. I'm not as good as that. I'm not as high as that, but I can, you know, that pure tone of voice without that, the character that I really loved from some of the artists. And so that was really the key for me to realize that it's okay to sound like go to your strengths, but even just discovering what my strengths are to this day, I haven't figured it out. Like I'll sing a song, I'll write a song and sing it. And I'm like, Hey, that's awesome. It's like, it's in my range it's in the, my key, whatever it is. I'm like, this is great. And then the very next day or the next week, I can write another song that, okay, I'm going to write it in that key again, because that was in my range. And I'll have a hell of a time trying to sing that. And I don't understand it. And the more I analyze it, the worse it gets. So I just kind of, as I just do the best I can. And <laughs> I don't know a hundred percent. I mean, I definitely have a better idea of which way, which lane to lean into now than I used to but I still don't know for sure if it's going to work from song to song, uh, even in the same key, even in the same vocal range. And I have no idea why, if it's phrasing, if it's mental, if I'm just tired that day, if it's, I have no idea. Uh, I do the best I can. And some days it's actually pretty good. Like I'm, I like that. And some days it's like, you know, let's add some chorus or we're going to add a little distortion underneath it and blend it in to make it sound a little better. So I don't know. So that actually is a good segue to uh, sitting in the rain. Do we actually get to hear you sing on this one? You do. Yes. All right. Yep. Tell me about sitting in the rain. Other than that, it's like the most fun thing to do ever. Um, <laughs> tell me why, you know, not why, but what, what's the song about other than, you know, observing the weather. Right. Um, 
so that one was written in Falm 2013. Um, and I don't really remember how I got into the headspace I was in for that one, but you know, the song is basically just talking about getting through pain, trials and tribulations that we all go through. And how do you do that? And I, you know, revelation, I don't think my mother ever actually told me to go sit in the rain, but for some reason, when I was writing this and I was feeling all that, that just getting through it and how, how to be strong enough, you know, and, and dealing with some, some crap. And that phrase came out, you know, my mama told me and it luckily wasn't, didn't sound too country and it fit and it was I'm like, okay, yeah. And I got done with that song and I knew I liked that song. That was one of the keepers or one of the ones I liked better, but it wasn't until a while later that um, I went back and listened to it that I really uh, kind of realized just how much I connected with it, even though, again, I, I'm big on songs being truthful, like they got to be honest, but not factually correct necessarily. So I don't, you know, I'll change the color of the dress. I'll change what was said. I'll change all that if I can get to the truth, if I can make it connect emotionally, if I can get to what I'm trying to, to say, or if I can make it connect with me, even as a listener, after I've written it, that's way more important than getting everything else exactly right. So, so this is one of those songs that I listened back. I, I, I liked it, but I listened back and it actually had a little bit more of a connection for me and it seems like the music that I write that I like the best are the ones I connect with. And it doesn't always mean they're the ones that other people like the best, but they're definitely the ones that I like the best. And then I will just also say uh, John Staples did a cover of this uh, a couple years ago. That's absolutely phenomenal. It's wonderful. How cool so, is that when people cover your I, music? That was the first that was out of the I think it was out of the blue. He might have asked ahead of time. I, I think he did, but he was but you know, and he's a fiddler and, you know, has his style and, and did it. And I, I told him, I said, I think it's better than the original. And he basically told me to shut the hell up, but, but it was like, like, I loved the emotion that he put into that song. And I think what I really liked the best about it, cause he did a great version was I was able to listen to it as a fan, even though I was the songwriter because somebody else was doing, it. I didn't have to listen to myself and nitpick it apart and do whatever. So I could listen to it as a fan and it really made a better, like, I, f I felt guilt-free listening to it and enjoying it because it was no longer me singing it. But this song is one of the first ones that I really, you know, I was like, okay, I'm a songwriter. Like I've always been a songwriter. I call my songwriter, but I'm a songwriter. Like I will release this. I will put this one out. I will send it off into the world. I think it's good enough without doubt, too much self-doubt. So it was kind of a milestone for me even though I've got other songs even older that I like just as much and were good. This one, I had the intention to write it. I wrote it. It turned out good. And now I want to release it. So it has a multiple meanings for me. Hey, uh, I like what you said about changing the details, but like keeping it true. Um, um, have you listened, if you listen to the Pete Murphy episode is pretty good one. And he has a whole song about a, um, somebody's headaches or dizzy spells yeah emma's dizzy spells and it's actually about himself and uh emma was going to be his name he was supposed to be a girl or something or if, if he was a girl he would have been named emma so he can write about emma which is himself but it's about emma which sounds you know yeah. like he just wrote about something and it's pretty cool so it's like uh kind of like covertly autobiographical which I thought was pretty neat. Uh, well, that's a pretty good episode. If you guys hadn't heard that, go check out Pete Murphy. He's really talented too. And he's about as prolific as TC, if not more prolific than anybody I've met. A dude has like 50 albums out or something. Yeah. Um, and he actually releases like it, it's all on like band camp, you know, so he goes through the, the full Monty to get it all out. But uh, yeah, well, let's play sitting in the rain and uh, get our first take on TC's vocals, man. And um We'll come back and uh, admonish you after. I'm just kidding. We'll come back and uh, talk about it afterwards after we hear it. And uh, I might put on some more fake shades or something. For you guys listening on Spotify, you should uh, double up. Check out the YouTube channel uh, over at live.gsladeshow.com. Uh, that'll forward you to it because, you know, on YouTube, you got this weird URL. When you start, it's like gibberish. So 
Right. Uh, and once I'm up to a hundred subscribers, guys, I can make it youtube.com slash G Slade show or something like that. So, you know, if you're not subscribed, go do that, but, um, let's play sitting in the rain and we'll be right. Holy crap, that's the most technically challenged song I've ever played, man. Um, <laughs> this would have been a hell of a live show. We should have done it live and everybody could get all that. Yeah, my um, for those just listening, my webcam was just turning off. I'm just sitting here enjoying it and suddenly I'm looking at like my profile picture, um, which, I mean, don't get me wrong, pretty sexy. Just going to say, you know, about as sexy as I can be, you know, I'll put it that way. <laughs> a little more a little more subjective there g slade sexy yeah g sexy uh so sitting in the rain good stuff man and it's funny because i uh said you know well you could probably do tom petty like stuff and to me that was tom petty like stuff i don't know yeah. if you you know like that comparison or not but that's just what i got out of it. i'll take tom petty i don't hear it but i'll take tom petty i love tom petty i think he's one of one of America's underrated songwriters for sure. So 
underrated by the uninformed maybe i mean if you've ever listened to him i mean i, I think he's i think he's more taken for granted than under than underrated maybe um i don't know i always rank him in the top two or three american bands as tom petty and the heartbreakers like you know england seems to have a a bunch to choose from you got beetle stones a whole you know everybody but in america who do you have like rock like rock and yeah i mean you got tom petty and then maybe guns and roses and maybe aerosmith you know yeah, as far as songwriters yeah and i mean the, the big three that come to mind i mean you've got you know you got van halen i mean there's i don't know it's it, but to me you know i say tom petty's pro- maybe my favorite or maybe the best and i always get push back on that if i've ever had a conversation you know the lunchroom conversation about the best american rock band and you know just bringing them up and i think he's he's kind of like kind of like everybody's top five but nobody's number one or very few people's number one if that makes sense but to me i think especially songwriting if you throw that into it it really it really bumps them up to the top of the list for me well i think that's a different league you have bands you have performers you have pop stars but are they songwriting? And I'll, I'll throw out there, it may be popular for this audience or not. One of my favorite current songwriters, and what I think at the end of her career, she'll be in that top five conversations, Taylor Swift. I mean, the argument can be made for her right now, just for songwriting, um, that she deserves to be much more respected than she is. Um, just from, you know, just from songwriting. I mean, if you look at also, you know, the number of people, number of fans she has, and I mean, I'm not big into the pop lane. I'm, I'm not, but you can learn a lot from, from pop music and she, her music's one of those that you can learn a lot from. I mean, it, it's, it's worth studying. Now that doesn't mean it's necessarily what I, I don't listen to Taylor Swift hardly at all if ever but i have a personal playlist on spotify called tay tay and it's just taylor swift songs i'm not gonna lie uh but you know she mastered two completely different genres she was winning all the country awards and topping all the country charts and then she's like "Eh, i'm gonna do pop and now she's one of the biggest pop stars in the world arguably the biggest you know because she's at that point where it's like you know everybody would rather prove she's not the biggest and i think at that point it's because you are the biggest you know what i mean (laughs) right yeah if not the biggest pretty darn close or they wouldn't be arguing about it and it's all transient right nobody's the biggest every day of every year you it come it ebbs and flows but her moments on top have been huge and um we actually invited her on the show one time she didn't make it she didn't Mm -hmm. make it i guess she was she had a scheduling conflict or something prior commitment yeah prior commitment but Taylor, that invitation's still open. Uh, we could do live stream, whatever. Anyway, TC is the point today, so we're gonna talk about that. But yeah, no, I thought I thought your uh, song there, "Sitting in the Rain," when I finally played the right one, uh, was you know in that to me that Tom Petty vein with the vocal style and then the acoustic, you know, backtrack. But you still had that electric, you know, uh, addition there too. Though, so you had a couple of different ingredients there. It was just the right amount of seasoning, you know. Uh, what was going on with this song is I'm, um, I've i never played uh, for the the uh, show before off of VLC, so I made a VLC playlist. Um, and I click the song, like I, I click on the song. You're sitting in the rain's highlighted. I hit play, and it just starts at the beginning of the playlist, which is whichever, whenever. I guess I could just delete that song, and that wouldn't be the issue. But, you know, uh, I'm going to try double-clicking it. I'm going to try double clicking the next one that we're going to do. But um, yeah, um, I feel pretty validated that I said you could probably do Tom Petty. And then we played that song. I, I'll i take the compliment and kind of going back to what you were talking about, uh, vocal lane or vocal, how to sing. This is one of the songs that's just, I, you know, I moved it. I wrote it probably in G. I write everything in G, it seems like. And then move the capo up two or three frets. And so it's just a little bit on the edge of the, not out of the range by any stretch, but just a little bit up there where you got to push on a bad day, not vocal warmed up. It's not going to be on pitch that one of those things. And to me, that's a good spot. Like I like having a little bit of like 
I hear strain in that vocal. It's not a bad vocal. I'm not trying to say it's a bad vocal. Although I can do a better vocal today. If I was recording that today, it would be, it would be better, but, but it just enough to oomph. like you got to, sometimes you got to have a little bit of strain or a little bit of up against, you know, just not comfort zone in order to get a good vocal or to get it to go through. And that vocal that, like I was talking about Robert Cray, that's my version of the pure clean vocal. And that I was not really a fan of, but I realized that that's something that I at least can aim for and try to do and that it can work. And in that song, I think that was exactly the vocal it needed. You know, you didn't want something breaking up. You didn't want gravel. You wanted something clear because of the sound of the song. So. Cool, man. Well, I'm going to keep rolling and um, just roll into the next song. So cool. the next one queued up is called High and Higher, and it's labeled as uh, 50, 90, 20, 20. So fairly recent song. 50, 90, for those that don't know, is from, I think, July 4th to October 1st. Yes. Uh, so this is, you know, at most a seven-month-old song and as little as, a, you know, I guess – Blah, blah 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 three or four months i don't know i can't do math today anyway tell me about high and higher maybe i could play it i don't know um well i know what it means to me but i haven't had that reaction from other people so i don't know that i want to give that away um well how about i play it and then i tell you what i thought and then you you could tell me what you think you want to do that absolutely that sounds great cool that's what we're gonna do Maybe. I'm going to double click it this time. See what happens.
didn't stop that prematurely, did I? There wasn't like a <laughs> no. major like note at the end where you're like, oh, or something like that. Nope. All good. My bad. I didn't want to like start the next one. You know what I mean? Like just trying to catch it. Yeah, I'm going to get this down one day. You never know. Yeah, you're doing all right. All right. So what did I get out of it? Um, Man, I'm trying to think. You know, sometimes you got to hear it more than once. Like the chorus, I have no idea what that metaphor is, honestly. Um, I was, li- you know, the, the verse invoked more feelings of like just kind of being tired um, in general and, you know, looking for a reprieve just from whatever rut you're in you know is kind of what i personally got out of it but tell me what we we're supposed to get out of it <laughs> or what you well um i've not told anybody about this and nobody picked up on it and so this was another uh song fight title so i wrote it in 5090 but it was uh, i also put it on song fight um where I've got, they do reviews can be a little harsher over there, although they've softened up in the last last few years, I would say. Um, but and what you're saying is softer than like say Falm, where everybody's well defaults to the supportive. Yeah, and fifty ninety where they default to supportive. Yeah, so I would say Song Fight now is very supportive, but they're not afraid to tell you what they hear wrong. Like if something's not working or if, if something's like, that's the first thing out, you know, you, you see your band name and, and see what they're going to say. If something's not good in their opinion, they're not afraid to just immediately say it. Now it's usually like 99% of the time, 90% of the time, it's not mean spirited at all. I would say almost all the time it's not mean spirited, but um, there are a few like old school, like 2004, 2000, whatever, they would be blunt. Like they would be rude about it. Like, they could be really rude. Now it's it's way more supportive, but comparatively to to Fom, you know, Fom's pretty much. I, I I get in trouble for saying it's cheerleading because it doesn't really capture it. But you know, it's to be creative, and as long as you're being creative, that's good. It doesn't matter. Now, you know, there's varying degrees of that, but at Song Fight, you know, the idea is to write and record a song, not just write a song, but and record a song and put it up. So that adds that level of there's production. Even if you're just an iPhone recorder, you know, the timing is important. Being on key is important. Um, And if you do a full production, it needs to be pretty tight. If you've got timing issues, which I've been listening to these songs that you've been playing and hearing little things that I've been spotting that I want, you know, I think we all do that. Nobody really picked up on it, but um, I'm pretty, pretty happy with the lyric. But really, this is just a song about suicide to me. And well disguised, like not necessarily a dark place, but just contemplation of it. Um, Obviously, a dark place is suicide, but not like eminent, like right now. But I think if anybody's ever had the thought pass through your mind, that's not been serious, not like, okay, I'm going to go get a gun or I'm going to get the pills or whatever, but you're just like, you know, what would it be like if I was gone from the world or what could I do? Or or I'm feeling lost to me. This is trying to be that. Now the music is upbeat. It's a pretty happy sounding melody. So there's a little bit of a, inconsistency, maybe confusion, a catch 22 wrapped up in there, which I think is common a lot of times when you're trying to work through something or when you're contemplating or what can you do or you get lost, but you're still trying and you're, you know, you're, you're wanting to, to do better. So to me, it, it's kind of a weird, maybe inconsistent thought, but that's where I was coming from writing the song. So, yeah. Uh, well, to be honest, when I was listening, I thought that the explicit meanings of the words were more suicidal. And I was like, what I was thinking, OK, well, it's a metaphor for just a funk in general, not actually about suicide. So I guess what I was doing was not going with what the actual words were, but trying to get some other meaning out of it. So it's weird how your assumption about the song can also affect your interpretation. Cause yeah, I mean, the lyrics are obviously like you're talking about ending the life or not being in the life. Right. 
And uh, so it was high and higher, like ascending spirit or something like that. Um, yeah, in a way, I think. Um, honestly, writing the lyric and then looking back at it when I was done with it was kind of too different. Like, oh, crap. And maybe partway through realizing where it was headed and, and kind of buying into it and finishing it that way. Um, you know, there's, I don't know. I think that you're like what you were saying. It's like maybe superficially it would lean towards suicide, but it's really when you get the feeling, the emotion, it's not really like the ultimate trying to commit suicide. It's not trying to be that deep. It's not that. Yeah. It's not far everybody off. hurts or anything like that. Right. And I think that's it. But I mean, it is kind of optimistic too. It's, it's saying standing high and higher, looking for a way out of this hell, you know, wondering if the whole damn world can tell, but that could be, I mean, to me, that's negative. Like looking for a way out of this hell could be positive or negative, right? Like figuring out. Well, to me, it's you're looking for a solution to a problem, which yeah. I don't consider suicide a solution. Uh, so to me, you're searching for a solution to the hell that gets you out of it and but also preserves life, you know? So I, I think that's why I wouldn't go like, oh, it's a suicide song. Cause to me, that is not where I just, you know, it's not where I go yeah. in general, unless it was like really explicit, like, you know, I'm picking up the blade or whatever, you know? Right. right. Uh, then it's kind of like not, you can't even interpret that. Right. That's pretty explicit. So, um, I mean, in particular, uh, you know, things going on then, or was that just stream of conscious, you know, writing? Yeah, it wasn't. Um, it wasn't any one thing that kind of set that off. And I do think that it's, you know, like kind of going at that idea with a hopeful look at it. Like definitely it, to me, it's more a contemplation of what if, and you know, why would I think of something like that? And that's where that song is coming from as opposed to, maybe a more serious, you know, action. Um, but yeah, I, I don't, I didn't have, um, you know, it's not somebody I knew. It's not anything going on in particular or anything like that. I do like that song a lot. Um, but it was just kind of, and, and I'm interested in, in how other people take that song because, I think there is an emotional connection there that I have with it, but knowing where my thoughts were kind of in. So a lot of times I'm writing the song and then, and then it kind of reveals to me the direction it's going. I'm like, Oh crap. I didn't realize that while I'm writing it. Sometimes it's after the song's over and you go, Oh, there's another layer or something to that song or to the lyric. So, and you know, writing, writing a lyric is difficult. Um, and I, I like to call myself a blue collar lyric lyricist in the sense that they work, but they're not necessarily, you know, there's prose and there's poetry and there's, you know, there's art. And then most of my lyric are, they get the job done. You know, they're blue collar. Um, I'm definitely there with you, man. I don't think there's anything poetic about most of my stuff, you know, but uh, they get the, like you said, they carry the message and get the job done and yeah, come back next tomorrow and do it again. <laughs> right. Right. And every once in a while I'll, I'll read back or I'll, you know, I'll write a line and go, Oh, that's awesome. You know, that's good. where that, where the hell did that come from? So, yeah, I mean, it almost, that song in particular, you know, the more I think about it, I mean, it could just be like not even conscious, but subconsciously decompressing because, you know, yeah. life in general is fucking overwhelming. If I can use some profanity on my own show, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty overwhelming and there's nothing wrong with acknowledging that it's overwhelming. And I think, a lot of uh not all i'm not even gonna throw a percentage out but i know a lot of mental health issues come from trying to put on a facade that you are all right sometimes you'll feel better about being like no i'm not all right and actually seeking you know some help whether it be from just your family at home or friends or professional help that's what you need oh definitely i think i think that and i don't know where i was reading but you know talking about how um putting a good face on for years before realizing that maybe talking to somebody would be a good idea and like trying not to let family and friends down and, and feeling a failure, which kind of contributes to feeling like a failure because you're afraid to let somebody down, but you're feeling a certain way, but 
you know, and it kind of snowballs, you know, it, it's a negative synergy. It, it kind of reinforces the negative feelings and the lack of self-esteem or whatever it is that, that could be going on. And I think having the, the courage to admit to yourself that, or, or maybe caring about yourself enough. So I read, I don't even know who did it. I've got terrible memory, but somebody said you should treat yourself as if you were responsible, as if you were somebody you were responsible for. So you should treat yourself as if you were somebody you were responsible for. So for instance, if you are responsible for a child, how would you treat that that child? Now, that doesn't mean you're never angry at them. It doesn't mean that you, you're you never, you know, frustrated. It doesn't uh, mean Jordan, that. It was Jordan Peterson that wrote that in the, oh. in the rules for life, I believe, the okay. 10 or 12 rules for life. That was one of his principles. The 12 rules of life. Um, I haven't read that book, so I don't know where I got that from. Obviously stole it from him. But um, in that idea, I love that idea in the sense that um, if you take care of yourself as if you were, you know, you were responsible for that person, then I think we treat ourselves a lot better. Like you would take the time to get some sleep. You will take the time to maybe eat a little better, or you'll take the time to maybe get a little bit of help if you need it. And that doesn't necessarily mean professional help or, or whatever. It could be talking to a friend, the family, it could be exploring different options. It may be reassessing what you're doing or, or you know, making changes in your life, but ne not necessarily. It's just, you could know, could be writing a song. I, I tell you that writing songs, my therapy, that's, I get a lot of crap out that I didn't even know I was dealing with when I'm writing songs a lot. And sometimes it's not even a song about that. You know, the idea of the um, suffering artists and that's where the good art comes from. Um, I find with me, I write about a lot of, of dark things that I have in the past. I'm trying not to do so much, but, you know, writing about death, writing about stuff. But I've not faced a lot of hardships or been in a dark spot a lot of times. And I think one of the reasons is because I'm able to talk about that. I'm able to write about those things through my songwriting. I'm able to deal with some of those things before it builds up, before it becomes, you know, I say a problem, but before it becomes an issue that's affecting me consciously on a day-to-day -day basis, and I'm just being able to deal with that stuff. And, you know, songwriting is therapy to me. I mean, that's, the easiest way to sum it up in, in some sense. Now, I've, I've used that exact same phrase before that, because it's a healthy way to vent because for one, you don't yeah. even have to play the song for anybody if you don't want to, but right. you can, you know, go write a song. Like I was going through a very, very uh, high tense, emotional, dramatic, whatever you want to call it, divorce in 2012. And, I wrote a lot of songs and they weren't like explicit, like, you know, this woman is not a good person. Like it wasn't like lyrics like that, you know, but it was just boiling over, you know, rage for lack of a better word, where like every song was like, bro, you all right. And it's like, well, I am now like, shit, I got to, you know, I got to express <laughs> myself and uh, have a drink or two. And, uh, right. You know, you move on to the next day. So, uh, yeah, because I mean, when you write a song, you're not worried about, um, how you know it, to me it's honest like it's pure and you can get your thoughts out without a filter you know like you're not worried about hurting your own feelings you know so you're going to say what you want and you know you're not really on guard you're you know you're pretty vulnerable and open when you're writing a song yeah. uh you know which is why it's hard sometimes for artists to show their art right because it's so personal or it, it's a risk you're putting yourself out there so i mean that's uh yeah. the whole thing right there about art and I, I find most compelling art is you know more away from the center as far as like pleasant or happy stuff goes most of our favorite songs you know aren't like happy go lucky songs or and our favorite movies or dramas and adventures at best you know where there's conflict and you know some resolution uh, you know, people like happy endings in some instances, but, you know, thrillers, murder mysteries are the most, you know, best books out there. Yeah. 
uh, you know, uh, so I don't know. There's something about art that appeals to the uh, less um, happy-go-lucky side of, of humanity. It's like, I've never really been inspired to write, you know, I'm having the best day ever. You know, I've never really felt that energy. when. I yeah, I, I think, well, there's a couple of things. I think that songs mean something to us when there's an emotional connection. Like a song is, succe is successful when it makes a connection emotionally. Um, now that can be happy. It can be sad, but I think, you know, in our, our saddest moments are the ones that stay with us the most. Um, so it makes sense that a song that helps commiserate or helps ease or, you know, makes it okay, you know, to feel that way through song will help us. So I think that, that, that means a lot from the listener I think writing a song like that can mean a lot. I like, I like that songwriting, you can, I can make it a character. Like I can sing from the narrator's point of view and I can actually, you know, if it's something that, that I'm dealing with subconsciously, even doesn't matter, but if I'm dealing with it, I can put it on this character that's going through it. So I, I'm allowed, I'm allowing myself to have these emotions, get this emotion out, but it's still not, I'm not having to look myself in the mirror necessarily to sing that and and sometimes it is i mean sometimes that's me singing it instead of just me singing the song but it, i guess it always is to a certain extent but being able to have that one step removed even though it's what i'm you know either consciously or unconsciously saying is i think it's important and i think when you do it well then you have more emotional connections to your listeners and that's when that song means more to other people and that's yeah i mean a good solid rock song about partying is great and i like a lot of those songs but you know listening to the classic rock station there's a ton of those songs you know and it doesn't really matter which one comes on to some extent but you get a solid song that really means something to you and that's that's not as com with as much music as we have available to us it's not as common as i think it should be or could be yeah my favorite uh beatles stuff was the darker songs you know not necessarily hold my hand but like the song help i think was my favorite by them and which was john feeling really dark about things going on he was literally crying for help you know so and and then in my life was another one on that album i thought i think it's on that album I don't want to misquote the Beatles albums. I'll offend somebody out there. I think in my life was on help. Uh, maybe it was. I don't know. I hope you're that or a rubber soul. I just feel like I'm digging a hole now. Oh, well. <laughs> I'm going to be honorable and not edit that out. But uh, anyway, that's my point is like, yeah, they're darker stuff. I appreciate. And it's funny. A lot of stuff sounds like a party song and you really listen to it. And it is a dark song, right? Yeah, there's a lot of songs like that. Um, yeah, I mean. What was the Lita Ford Nazi song back in the eighties? If I close my eyes, you know, like they were banning suicide solution because of the title. And then they go and write a song about it and, and it's top 10 radio play all across America because they just, you know, the way they tackled the subject, you know, the way they titled it. So. Yeah. Uh, on a, not quite as heavy note, but like that song, all I want to do is make love to you is about, you know, a wife just shagging a stranger because <laughs> her hubby can't knock her out. It's crazy when I finally, <laughs> as an adult, listen to that, you know, cause as a kid, you just hear the hook. You're not listening to right. the words, you know, you just think it's catchy and it's like, okay, we're singing about random affairs to lie to this man about having a baby. It's like, that's heavy, but catchy is heavy. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. Um, was it the most common example is um, Every Breath You Take with, by the police and being a stalker song instead of a love song. Yeah, it's um, pretty creepy. I wonder if I've ever written anything really dark that comes off not so dark. I'd have to think about that. Um, I don't know. But that's a good segue into Nights and Weekends, which is your uh, next song. It's the last one we have queued up for tonight. Uh, so tell me about Nights and Weekends. Um, that one is kind of my take. It wasn't, it didn't start off this way, but it was kind of my take on a bottle rocket song, uh, waiting on a train. 
Um, and it's the story of a fellow trying to visit his daughter. I mean, his kid um, being separated, maybe not not being in the best place in his life and and just trying to get there. Um, yeah, I mean, pretty straightforward. Lyric speaks for itself, I think. Um, I like the song a lot. Um, and I, I will, so I was, I, I mentioned um, earlier, but, uh, you know, my parents uh, were married until I was about five years old, but my dad was in the Air Force, so um, I never really had uh, mom and dad together. And my mom did remarry, so I had, you know, father figure in the house and I was able to visit, but I didn't really suffer through that um it was just the way it was. So I, I, I felt like it wasn't a big negative or a broken home has caused me, you know, problems. I'm sure it affected me in ways I don't understand. So for me, this song isn't like a personal thing, but there's so many people, actually one of the guys that was working for me at work was going through something similar to this. Um, and I, you know, you hear those stories and you see the people that you care about. And, and like, I've had family member after family member after family member going through similar things. And so this one means a lot to me more from the people around me than personal experience, but definitely uh, it still strikes a chord with me, I guess. It like, it, I just see it. And I think it, I don't know. I think I'm talking it up too much, but it's just straight ahead missing my trying to see my kids song oh uh, man i've written one of those too because i am a divorce parent myself and uh i wrote a song called broken family that was about not seeing the kids and uh the most most excellently talented katie dwyer sang the chorus on that and so that really made the song listenable in my opinion um <laughs> And, and maybe uh, maybe we have a show scheduled with her. Maybe we don't. You have to find out. Um, well, we're going to play Nights and Weekends uh, by Mr. T.C. Elliott. And um, I'm pretty sure I could play the song correctly. And I'm not going to play with those video filters. That's what my camera was messing up. I guess Sky, uh, not Skype. Zoom was trying to tell me to settle down uh, with, with, with the filters. So if you're listening on Spotify, you should really check this one out on YouTube. It's uh, entertaining the outtakes more than anything um and, and shout out i want to uh give credit so uh you guys are familiar with captain vulpine uh he is my video editor so when you're watching youtube if it wasn't a live stream if it was one of these pre-recorded ones and it's edited and all fancy you could thank mr captain vulpine for that excellent excellent awesome. um collaborator to have on this type of stuff I stick out my thumb Only eight miles from town It's so cold early this morning And my old car broke down I've got a little girl Supposed to be there by ten I only get to see her a few nights And every other weekend The judge said Supervised. I'm doing 
All right, man. <clears throat> I saw I like the song. I can relate to it. It kind of made me mad though. Like, screw that judge, man. Right. <laughs> Wasn't happy with the judge either. <laughs> yeah, so I like I said, I have a terrible brain here, but were you saying this was autobiographical from your point of view or from your friends or from your dad's point of view or how, how does that work? Yeah. So completely not autobiographical, the opposite of that. Although I did have uh, a, an employee now ex employee a friend who was going through um, not being able to see his son, his, he and his fiance broke up. She took the son not being able to, you know, visit um, the whole nine yards, like, and, and it was a long process, a month, months long process as these types of things usually are. Um, and so he was going through a lot of that. So that was kind of one of the, one of the reasons to, I guess it brought it home for me that it was on my mind or whatever and seeing what he's going through. And, and I think, you know, in these situations, that's usually like it's usually not any one person's fault. Um, you know, sometimes things happen, or somebody will do something that ends a relationship or whatever. But usually, when 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 a visitation happens and things aren't working out, you know, there's there's more than like we were talking before. There's more than one perspective, and it's usually a, a, a failure to be able to meet and be able to agree. And I think for him, you know, seeing that he would make mistakes, but he would also be trying to do the right thing and somebody else would make mistakes, you know, the other party and all those types of things happening. And, you know, you hate to see somebody else go through that. And then, you know, I, like I said, my, my parents weren't together and I, I was lucky enough that I didn't have to, I didn't, I either wasn't old enough or they weren't around where they weren't just at each other's throat. They were pretty amicable to each other for my sake like they did they worked together to make sure I was taken care of from the time I was five or six years old all the way up so you know they did definitely didn't agree on things and definitely didn't necessarily want to you know spend time together but but they did everything that that was necessary to make sure that I was taken care of I never saw that negative side of them they were as did it as well as could be done so for me, it was really, but, you know, the, seeing that from, from an outside perspective, I think is, I think we've all seen that because there's no two situations that are identical. Yeah. I would, I've actually been divorced twice, both times had at least one child with, with the uh, person I was married to. I'm married for a third time now to the best lady ever. Shout out to Jess. She's awesome. Uh, she actually jumped on a couple of farm tracks this past year. It was awesome. Hopefully get her back out here this year. But yeah, the, I, I don't like, it sounds like a joke, but it's not, but I got way better at divorce the second time. You know? <laughs> <laughs> the first time. Um, yeah. We weren't really thinking, you know, we got together very young. I was 17 uh, when my child was born, you know, mm. and that was about a year into our relationship or whatnot. So we were together about eight years or so, I want to say, you know, I was 23 or 24 is when we split up. And what did it for me was I uh, noticed after we had some particularly heated fights and whatnot, like my, my oldest kid brought home an F and she's a straight A student. And I was like, man, this is like, this is wrong. It's affecting the kids and we got to get better at this. And that's about as far as we got. We didn't get too much better at it, but we kept it to ourselves, or at least out of the kids' view. Uh, the two, the, the biggest differences in, in divorce between my first divorce and second is that regardless of both of, you know, both times it didn't work out, both times we got divorced. And I think both times we both did things that made it not work. You know, and we, we I, I say we have, shared responsibility in the failure of the marriage but the difference with the second one is we both agreed that the child's life should not be affected as much as possible right it's gonna be affected in, in a sure. certain way but not to ever use the child you know the children as uh, bargaining chips or pawns you know or power plays between us and 
with my first divorce, I felt like we came up short there. And the second one, it's like, okay, we tried to spare, you know, like as much as we disagree on personal things, we could agree on like going back to what we were talking about. Right. Let's see what we can agree on. And we agreed that we wanted um, Layla. That's our daughter. Uh, Layla's life to be the best life possible. And so that's how we approach conversations. All right. What's best for Layla. That's all we need to talk about, you know, you know, our lifestyles and whatnot or whatever, you know, we got divorced for a reason. Let's not try to, I mean, there's right. no point in trying to win a debate or anything like that. What's best for the kid here. And, uh, you know, I'm glad I've never been in a situation where I had to have like supervised visitation. I, you know, I, I do get the weekend thing that drove me crazy, you know, uh, and I, I felt like such a loser after the second divorce. I was like, I, the last thing I wanted to do was go through that again, you know, and you go from seeing your kid every day to seeing your kid twice a month maybe a little more of something, you know, is, you know, you're picking her up for a play or, or hanging out one extra day, but it, it's just crazy. So if you, you know, as a parent, if you have kids, you know, value that time because it, you can't take it for granted. For one, you never know if your marriage is going to work, regardless of how good it is today. There could always be a reason you're going to be separated. And one day they're going to move out anyway. So, you know, don't take that time for granted. Um, especially if you're in the middle of, of a divorce or you think you might be, if you can avoid a divorce, I'd say don't avoid it just for the kids because I don't think that's helpful. But if you can reconcile, like don't just get divorced out of pride, right. You know, like work it out. You guys got together for one reason. And I didn't know this was going to turn into the <laughs> wife, life, uh, dad, you know, vibe, uh, advice hour but I, we, I have a lot of experience in failed marriages and not seeing and, and i tell you what there's nothing to me there's no silver lining to only seeing your kids every now right. and then yeah. except that i guess they're healthy and you can see them but there's no you can't look back and justify that right um to me it's just it's just heartbreaking that was what the song katie and i did i think it was in 2012 when i was going through it how you know, it's literally like having your heart broken over and over and over every time they're picked up or even when it's almost time for them to get picked up. So, yeah, I mean, that's a deeply personal subject to me, as you could tell. But uh, yeah. so, yeah, that song, I was like, man, I feel that, you know, and something that I think dads get a bad rap just by divorce. You know, OK, you get divorced by default. It's like, OK, the dad must be the, the shithead here. Right. So. Yeah. So I've been married for. 21 years now, I believe right, Congrats. 20, 21 and a half. And, um, we've got two children. Um, so one's, uh, going to be 28 and one's 20. So a little bit older, gone through the stuff, but my oldest, I actually adopted. It was my wife's from a previous relationship. And I, when we first got together, she was still going through, well, a little bit after that, she was going through um, some stuff with um, her ex. And that definitely kind of went into this a little bit. And it's, you know, this song is from the dude's point of view, you know, like the other guy, like the exes. But, and I, you know, I definitely 100% on, on Team Phoebe. My wife is... You know, she's a great mom and I think she was a hundred percent in the right and everything that she was doing at that point, you know, luckily they would already broken up by the time I was there. So I didn't, that part, I don't know, but yeah, you know, you some of other, you, you weren't the other man or anything. No, no, it wasn't anything like that, but, but, you know, going through it and seeing what she was going through definitely, you know, helped me with the perspective of this song and being, um, you know, using per, even though I haven't been in this situation and I'm not trying to be the authority, you know, this is, this is one of those songs. I, I like the song a lot. And the reason I like it is it's telling the story of this one dude. And that's, that can be universal, even though it's not the same for everybody. You know, I'm just telling the story of one dude. This dude isn't, isn't my buddy. It's not me. It wasn't anybody in particular. It's kind of just this dude. But I think, this dude's story is an honest story and it's a story that a lot of people can relate to whether you've been through it or not. You know, if you've ever, you know, had anybody that's come out of 
the situation, you know that there is no, like you can make the best of the situation and you can be 100 percent on board with your ex and with the kids and everything. And it's still not a the best scenario. It can't be the best scenario because like you were talking about, I mean, if you don't get to see your kid every day when you used to be able to see your kid every day, it doesn't matter how well you get along. It doesn't matter anything. You're still miss. You always feel like you're missing out. So I was lucky growing up that I never really felt the missing out as strongly as, um, you know, somebody that grew up with both parents there and then the split. Um, but I definitely felt it, you know, my my dad eventually went to move to Texas. And so I was seeing him two months out of the summer and then maybe Christmas, um, maybe two other times in the year other than the summer. Now it was awesome. I get to go for, you know, six or eight weeks and, some you know get away. I love that. That was an awesome experience for me for years, for a long time, and and I think that helped me in a lot of ways. Um, getting out of my little small town Missouri viewpoint, and it, it helped me in a lot of ways. But you know that's that's not optimal either. So, no, I agree with you there, man. Um, so I grew up in a single parent home, but it was because my dad passed when I was eight. So. You know, I never did the go back and forth thing. Never had a stepdad or anything like that. And yeah, man, it, I don't know. That's like one of the worst feelings on Sunday when it's about three o'clock. And I'm like, damn it. You know, it's like an hour or two left. And what's amazing is how quickly the kids grow up. I mean, you you know, having your eight-year-old over for visitation is one thing. Having your 11-year-old that is basically a teenager now and all her older siblings are teens. You know, she's the baby you know like she came over this past weekend and literally spent it in her room because she has a a little brother at home that just you know bugs the shit out of her and so she you know she comes over and decompresses from that and she was literally in her room except for like she came out for dinner we did a family dinner one night and just kind of did our own thing the, the second night but uh she ate the family dinner with us and other than that she wanted to do her own thing you know i checked in on her i was like hey you good in here you want to go watch a movie and she's like "Hmm, no (laughs) <laughs> but she's in there making like sculptures you know and then putting it on tiktok i mean she's like crazy busy all the time she's she's not just watching tv yeah. um but yeah my point is like i could ramble about being divorcee <laughs> and, and not seeing your kids there's nothing to me nothing more rewarding than having good relationships with your kids you know uh just recently started to get a better relationship with my son i only have one son and and we had a weird relationship uh for many years and a lot of that's because him uh his mom and i just couldn't get it together you know we couldn't get along uh and so i think it naturally forced the kids not that we consciously forced the kids to be like team mom or team dad it just kind of devolved into that and uh so we but we've we've you know picked it up here lately but he's 20 years old and he's about to go off to the navy and stuff so right uh it's weird he's only been here since christmas like christmas eve literally is when he got here and he's only been here since then and i'm already like adjusted to it like you know i don't want this to end but right uh it has to so if you have kids it's you know it's going to end your kids are going to have to leave so you know enjoy the shit out of them And, and that doesn't mean you have to spend every night you don't have to feel guilty as a parent if you don't spend every night reading to your kid and watching movies and helping them study but do make them part of your life and do what they need and make sure they're happy. You know, sometimes they're happy by themselves, which is fine, yeah. but you know, they're there. Like I feel better just knowing my kids in the house, whether they want to hang out with dad or not, you know? Yeah. I think, I think it's consciously taking the time to enjoy them being around. And that doesn't mean every moment's perfect or that life is perfect happy all the time you know it's life it we all have issues and have to do anybody's had to deal with a teenager even the best teenager still a teenager so you know you've got things to deal with but you know it's kind of enjoying enjoying it consciously enjoying it while you can is is huge you know and i'm lucky both of my both of my daughters are are really good people and crazy in some ways and you know but you know, I love them both and miss them a lot. My oldest moved out to California last year with her fiance. So I haven't seen her in forever. And it's, you know, what, someday, what part of Cali? What part of Cali? I think they're outside of uh, San Francisco. 
They're in, uh, I think, I don't know where the, it is, but um, her fiance is working at the government lab over there somewhere. So, but. Cool. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a big step for them and it's life and moving on and all the things you want for your kids to, you know, to do and make a life for themselves. But, you know, not not being able to see her even and before that she was up in Iowa so you know three hours away so but we could go up and you know we might not visit for a couple months but we could go up anytime we really wanted to and we could keep in touch and now it's like you know even if I wanted to go over and help with something I couldn't do it so it's a it's an adjustment but you know she's going to be 28 it's not it's not yeah, like as a parent she, though, there's like no difference in 28 and eight, right? You just want to be parent and you yeah. want to be there. You want to get those, uh, what was it? Serotonin rushes from <laughs> hugs and things like that. Right. You know, I yeah. tell you, there's nothing like hugging your kid, right? Yeah. It's just, I don't know. The relationship that I had with my oldest daughter was kind of a roller coaster relationship from, um, from I'd say eight years old to 11 years old and then preteen and teenager. And um, we didn't get along super well there for a while. And then we got along really well there for a while. And it's just been one of those things, but um, you know, through it all, you know, she's my oldest, she's, she's loud. She's boisterous. She's a handful. I mean, there's no other way to talk about it, but she's always been the most responsible kid I've known when it comes to the big stuff. Now the little stuff, you know, homework done, she, not necessarily. And, and the mouth and all those things that you go through. I mean, she, I'm, you know, it's funny though. Kids that are, uh, I think mouthier end up being more independent as adults, you know, cause they're already kind of independent. And when they kind of get it together, they turn out to be pretty cool people. Yeah. Um, I know I was probably an annoying little kid. Like I was uh, very rebellious. Like, you tell me to do something is the easiest way to make me not want to do it. Like, right. Oh, yeah. And hell, I'm still that way as an adult. Yeah. So I can't imagine putting up with me, uh, especially as a kid, you know, I was like, ah, whatever, get out of my face. I'm with you a hundred percent on that. If, if you wanted me to do something, don't ask me to do it, you know? And it took me, it took me a while to realize uh, something that happened in my life. I was a teenager and being a little shit uh, and not realizing it, you know, i not self-aware and not realizing what I was doing, just being a little shit. And my dad came in from Texas, from out of town. And I was at my grandmother's house and he put me off to the side and he said, you know, you know, you really didn't treat your grand your grandmother very well right there. And, you know, I don't, don't think she deserves that. And he, to his credit, he treated me as an adult, you know, as somebody responsible for my actions. He didn't treat me as the teenager shit that I was being, which I completely deserved. And that opened my eyes. Now, my, I put my grandmother on a pedestal. I think she's a saint. Um, my dad once said it the best. He, in his entire life, never heard her say a bad word about anybody in his entire life. Like, she never said a bad word. Now, she wasn't perfect by any stretch, but I mistreated that woman. Not on purpose, but I mistreated. And that woke me at 13 years old or whatever it was, 14 years old, when I was being that little shit. And you know, I'm sure I did it again, but at least I had, it woke me up enough to realize that I'm in control of myself. I'm responsible for how I treat people. And I fail to this day. I fail and, you know, get frustrated and say things I shouldn't say and all those things that we all do. But, but that was a defining, I look back in my life, that was a defining moment to realize that I'm responsible for my own actions. And if I care about people, I need to act in a way that shows it. So, well, I'm with you, man. I tell you, it's been a pretty fun conversation. Uh, although we kind of ended here on a downer, so I don't want to end it there. But, uh, you know, we were talking about our early stuff in like 2008 and how it sucked. Yeah, definitely. I thought I would, um, I thought I'd do a special treat and play one of my songs from 5090 2008. Sweet. <laughs> So you guys can hear the and embrace the psychology of this song. But we're actually going to fade the episode out and post edit while we're doing this. So before I do that, TC, I want to thank you for coming on the show. And thanks for the great conversation and the fun music. 
Uh, hopefully we do it again. Hopefully we can hook up during fall I and mean, if not work together, at least chit chat a little and give each other some feedback. But before we uh, jump off, man, what, uh, you know, I'd love to end the shows with a little quip advice for other indie musicians out there. Cause uh, we, and not for divorced parents, but for <laughs> indie musicians, circle back to that. Uh, what advice do you have for uh, other indie musicians out there that might help them in their journey? Oh boy. Put me on the spot, huh? Um, I don't know. I think I hate to say it, but just do it. Like, I know for myself, that's the best advice is just do it. Um, whatever it is you think would be a good idea, whatever it is you need to do, whatever it is you need to learn, whatever it is, you know, that collaboration or whatever it is, the opportunity or whatever, just do it. Like, like try it. I think the best thing we can do, and I'm not a success by any stretch, but I'm happiest when I try stuff. And if I try it and it doesn't work out the best or whatever, I at least learn from it and have a good experience. So um, you know, whether that's the first collaboration, whether that's an in-person collaboration, it took me forever to do an in-person collaboration after being on FOM in 5090 and doing it. Um, you know, it's a different beast in a lot of ways, but in a lot of ways, it's exactly the same. Um, but, you know, don't be afraid to put yourself out there. Don't be afraid to try something new. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Like if, if just do it doesn't mean you have to do it all yourself. Um, and I've been really amazed by the few times I've asked for help um, with something or advice or help me with this or how do I do this or whatever. I've always had great responses, um, whether it's on Songfight, FOM, on the Internet, somebody local, the NSAI circle here in town. Um, it, it's been amazing how musicians in general and songwriters tend to want other people to succeed. It's not like some industries and at least my experiences at the local level where I'm at down here at the bottom, it's been, everybody helps each other. We do what we can. So that's what I got. It's worked so far for me. Well, that's good advice, man. Uh, thanks again for coming on the show. Hope you had as much fun as I did. And um, so we're, we're going to play this song. It's called hungry or why am I feeling so hungry? This is a 2008 uh g slade piece of crap from 5090 and uh we're gonna fade out so uh we'll talk to everybody on the next one awesome why am i feeling so hungry why am i Feeling so lonely, why don't I just call home and why am I sitting all alone? Did you leave your number on my bed, babe? Can I see you ever again, babe? Why am I feeling so hungry? Why am I feeling so lonely? I was at home looking at her. I wasn't alone till I took a shower And now she's gone and took the flowers She's been gone for too many hours Why am I feeling so hungry? Why am I feeling so lonely? Why don't I just call home? And why am I sitting all alone? Maybe I should have done better Maybe I should have not let her go to sleep Thinking all the wrong things came to me More with every single dream What is this crawling up my sleeve? I really miss her every time she leaves I want more, more of her insides I want more, more of her insides Why am I? Feeling so hungry, why am I feeling so lonely? Why don't I just go home and why am I sitting all alone?